Morning, Doctor. Can you Good morning. Tell us your uh, full name, please? I'm James Warren Hopper. And how do you spell your last name? H O P P E R. And what is your profession? I am a clinical psychologist by training, and I'm an independent <laughs> consultant. Showing you what's been marked as exhibit 716. Can you tell the jury what that is? This is my uh, curriculum vitae, it's like a fancy resume. Um, so let's just go through a, 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 some of this. Um, you went to college? Yes, I did. Where did you go to college? Uh, the University of Rochester in and New York. You, you graduated from there? Yes, I did. And uh, after that, did you prefer, uh, did you uh, pursue further education? Yes, I did. Where was that at? At the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And what did you do there? I got a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology there. What does that mean? That means I did about, you know, I was there seven years in all. It takes some time with all the research and everything. And I studied clinical psychology, so what kind of mental suffering people can have, psychiatric diagnoses, how to treat um, people with depression, post-traumatic stress, other things like that and a variety of other related issues uh, in terms of understanding people's psychology and how people can have psychiatric disorders and how to help them heal. Did you do any postdoctoral training? Yes, I did. What did you do there? So I did two postdoctoral fellowships. One was at a place called the Trauma Center, uh, also in the Boston area. And there I was a postdoctoral fellow where I was being trained to provide therapy for people with very complex trauma histories, so serious child abuse plus sexual assault, you know, very extreme trauma histories. And that was a place where I did a postdoctoral fellowship. And then later I did a fellowship at McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School in a place called the Behavioral Psychopharmacology Research Laboratory, which is quite a mouthful, but it's about understanding um, people's behavior in terms of chemicals and how um, drugs can affect their brain. Um, do you work uh, with a college or a university? Yes, I do. Um, tell us about that. So these days I'm a teaching associate at Harvard Medical School. Uh, this means that I consult to a clinic that is affiliated with Harvard Medical School. It's an addictions clinic and I consult as an expert on trauma. And that's something I do each week. And then I also do some teaching of residents. These are people who have already got their medical degree and are in training for psychiatry. And I'm brought in a couple times a year to teach them about some of the things I'm going to talk about here today, about how the brain responds to being attacked and how that can affect behavior and, and memory and things like that. And how long have you been uh, an instructor of some sort or a teaching associate at Harvard? Since 2006. Okay. Um, do you also do trainings um, for anyone in particular in your field? Yeah, so I do a lot of trainings where I, I translate what we know about trauma and what we know about how stressful and traumatic experiences affect people's brains and behaviors and memory. I translate that for police officers, for prosecutors, for judges. Uh, for people in higher education, for military commanders. So I take what we've learned from the science and I translate that to inform the work of those professions. Um, have you done, you've, I think even in your uh, CV there, you have uh, did a full day of training here in Wisconsin in the past, is that right? On that sounds 11. familiar, yes. Uh, on page 11, it looks like you were uh, down in Racine, Wisconsin, um, at the bottom of that page. Yeah, back in 2018, yes. What was that about? Same stuff that you've already talked about? Yeah, so I was training victim advocates, investigators, prosecutors, nurses, um, in the kind of things that, I'm, that I usually train about and that I'll be talking about here today. Okay. Have you also um, taken part in any research? Yes, I have. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I've done uh, research on post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, in a few different ways. So I've studied what we call the psychophysiology of that, which is how people who are traumatized and have post-traumatic stress disorder, how their body can react to being reminded of the trauma, how what we call their autonomic nervous system can react. And so I published some papers on that. 
Uh, I've also studied the nature of memories in people with post-traumatic stress disorder and how memories for traumatic experiences can be different from memories uh, from non-traumatic experiences. And I've done research, um, brain imaging research, where we take people who have experienced traumatic events and who have post-traumatic stress disorder, and we put them in a brain scanner, we remind them of their worst trauma. Now we do this in a compassionate way, we're not just tormenting people, but we remind them of their worst trauma in a way that helps them get back into that experience. And then we look at what happens in their brain when they're remembering that and how it's different in the brain. It can be different to remember a traumatic experience versus a non-traumatic experience. Or to remember a traumatic experience if you have post-traumatic stress disorder versus if you don't or if you have something we call dissociation, where people are feeling disconnected from their body, maybe emotionally numb, feeling like they're in a fog or floating. So I've done research to look at what's going on in people's brains when they're having that experience in the scanner, as opposed to feeling bombarded by the awful sensations and emotions, or in addition to that. In addition to being a part of that research, do you keep up with the current research that others are doing? Is that part of... Uh, I guess your job or just your profession? Oh, definitely. If I'm going to be translating this research for, for professionals and for people like you, I, I have a great responsibility to do that. And one of the benefits of being connected to Harvard is I have incredible access to, to the scientific literature. It's just at my fingertips. Okay. Have you testified in court before as an expert? Yes, I have. Um, prior to today, uh, when you've testified, was it always for the prosecution? No. Um, have you testified at a hearing in a sentencing case before for the defense once? Yes, I have. Other than that one time, and was that testimony at a trial or was that at a hearing? That was at a hearing on a, a death penalty case. So the person had already been convicted of the crime and sentenced to death. And this was years later, a hearing um, where I presented um, evidence or I, I presented knowledge about traumatic experiences that person had had and how that may have affected them at the time of the crime. Other than that testimony at that sentencing hearing, have you ever testified in court for a defendant in a criminal case? No. This is your first time? Yeah. Um, all your other testimony has been, besides the other incident that you talked about in this case, has been for prosecution. Yeah, for prosecution and in civil case for, um, for a, a plaintiff's attorney, for someone who was suing a perpetrator who had abused them when they were a child. Okay. <coughs> I want to uh, move on to the subject that you're, you're here to, to talk about today. Sure. And you'd use the term brain under attack. Is that right? Can you just That's one tell, of the Is that a term that you've used and you've published papers on or articles about? Yes, that's something I've written about and teach about. Um, and you, uh, you've done it before, and you've got a PowerPoint, I believe, that you've used in the past to help you explain that, right? I have various versions of the PowerPoint, depending on how long I have to teach people, yeah. Sure. Showing you what's uh, Exhibit 717. Does this appear to be a photocopy of some slides uh, that can be presented in a PowerPoint uh, regarding your uh, testimony here today? Uh, yes. Okay. Move for the admission of Exhibit 717, Your Honor. Any objection? No. Commission to publish uh, on the screen by a PowerPoint, Your Honor. All right, you may publish. Um, and I just want to go back. Was uh, Exhibit 716, was that the CV? Yes, Judge. And if I haven't offered that, I'd offer that now. Any objection to Exhibit 716? No. All right, Ex Exhibit 716 will be received. Thank so, uh, prior to my putting up the PowerPoint, <coughs> Um, there's different circuitry that the brain has, is that right? Yeah, so in neuroscience today, we use this metaphor, like a computer metaphor for the brain. It doesn't mean the brain is a computer, of course it's not. But we can understand how the brain works by understanding it as having different circuitries. And by circuitry, I just mean a collection of brain areas that works together to perform certain functions. So we have circuitries that allow us to remember things. We have circuitries that allow us to engage in certain kinds of behaviors, certain thought processes. And so that's a metaphor that's been found to be very helpful in understanding how the brain works. And the, the, this circuitor, uh, circuitry, 
uh, <coughs> can be associated with certain regions or areas in the brain. Is that right? Yeah, by definition, it's a collection of areas that work together to perform certain functions, yes. Okay. Madam Clerk, if I could have the... <coughs> so, uh, on, the on the screen there is uh, the slide with defense circuitry. You can see it there, or maybe you can see it up there, uh, Dr. Hopper, so whatever is most convenient for you. But sure. what's the defense circuitry? So, maybe you should hit the space bar to, to fill in a little more of it first. Um, so the defense circuitry is a circuitry that we all have in our brains and that all animals have some version of this. We've all, most of us, not all of us, have heard of the amygdala. Uh, this is a structure that's often mentioned in the media. Often the media way over ascribes to the amygdala function it doesn't have. But the amygdala is a key structure in a circuitry called the defense circuitry. And that circuitry is always on and it's always scanning for any sign of danger any sign of attack. It's constantly scanning and, and sampling what we're hearing, what we're seeing, maybe what we're smelling. It's even scanning for information inside of our bodies, you know, anxious feelings or scary memories or things, or things we're ashamed of that could arise in our minds. This circuitry is always on and it's always scanning for signs of danger. And this is something that evolution put into our brains uh, in order to help us avoid and survive attack by predators uh, that wanted to eat us, our ancestors, and that can help us avoid and survive da other dangerous situations that we might encounter. So this is a circuitry in everybody's brain. All of us have ours going on. It's operating automatically. We don't have to think about it all the time. Now, when this circuitry detects danger or attack, it then goes into high gear and it comes to dominate brain functioning. So is the defense circuitry typically in control? Or is something else typically in control in our brains? Well, to say anything's in control of the brain, we have to be careful about that. But okay. um, we're mostly creatures of habit, let's face it. Um, we're mostly creatures of habit. We're mostly going through life based on how we predict things to happen and our habitual ways of responding to situations and people. Um, but we have other a part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex behind our forehead that allows us to not just be creatures of habit, to use our reasoning capacities to do things when we need to maybe snap out of our habits or our, our usual patterns. So the defense circuitry is always on kind of idling in the background, monitoring for danger, but it's not usually running the show. We're usually acting out of habits and then we have this rational part of our brain that can you know, do course corrections and adjust and help us think things through as we need to. But we're mostly creatures of habit and there's a habit circuitry that's very well studied as well. In the, the rational part of the brain is generally associated with the region that you said was prefrontal cortex, is that right? Prefrontal cortex, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm moving on to the next slide here. Um, tell me about that. So this is a slide that I use in my trainings, pretty much all of them. Um, it comes early in the training as it's coming early here to basically just telegraph to people I'm teaching, you know, what are the points I'm gonna cover? What are the key things that happen when the brain is under attack or when you're in a really high stress situation. And so there's just a series of bullets that come under this, but they're all under this heading of the defense circuitry and control. Whether it's an incoming mortar round or an IED going off, or God forbid someone's starting to come in there with an automatic, uh, you know, semi-automatic weapon. When our brain detects these things or a predatory animal that's coming at us, when these things are detected, this circuitry kicks in and it takes control and it dominates brain functioning. Does it impair the prefrontal cortex at all? Yes, it does. And th this is something that is very well researched. Um, high stress impairs the prefrontal cortex, even just things that you can't control. If there was an annoying sound that was intermittently coming from the back of the room and it was distracting us and, and annoying us, that would cause some chemicals to be released that would start impairing our prefrontal cortex. So there's a continuum from stress up to fear and terror where this defense circuitry, as these things are happening, it can very rapidly hit the prefrontal cortex with stress chemicals and impair it. And this is very well studied. There's a woman named Amy at Arnston at Yale who's been studying this for decades. Amy Arnston at Yale, I'll try to slow down a little, who, who's been studying this for decades. And we know the, the chemicals that are involved, the receptors, electrophysiologically what's going on inside the cells of the prefrontal cortex 
And so this is something that's very well established in neuroscience, but it's also something we know from personal experience, right? We know that if we're freaking out or if we're suddenly feeling like we're under attack, if our child you know, walks into the street and almost gets hit by a car, we can very rapidly not be our usual rational selves uh, because it doesn't take long. It just takes like one to three seconds for that defense circuitry to hit the prefrontal cortex and impair it very significantly or even effectively take it offline. And when you said we, is this unique to any particular individual or is this what your research says happens to all of us who are human beings? Yeah, this is, this is a human phenomenon. You know, other intelligent primates that have a prefrontal cortex under high stress, under attack, this is one of the first things to be impaired. Now there are, of course, exceptions to everything. So special forces soldiers, they are selected and trained to help them retain access to their prefrontal cortex, even in really fast moving violent situations like taking out the ISIS leader, you know, just earlier this week. Those, those guys are specially trained to retain prefrontal cortex function. But the rest of us, most of us, uh, you know, when you're under attack and, and regular soldiers, we don't assume that they're going to have prefrontal cortex function. That's why the military trains, trains, trains people how to load and clean their weapons, how to engage in combat tactics. So they have habit learning. They don't have to think it through because you're not going to be able to do that in many situations. So this is the human brain under attack, whether it's physical assault, sexual assault, combat, an animal attacking you, it doesn't really matter. Is this one of the five main effects that traumatic experiences have on brain functioning? It's one of the five effects that I certainly you know, teach about and emphasize. There's many effects that it can have. But is it these another are one, bottom-up attention? Yes, so our attention is usually governed by our prefrontal cortex. We're focusing our attention on things that make sense to us in the situation we're in, in the goals that we have for the situation. So you are you know, playing your role as jurors, your prefrontal cortex allows you to listen to what I'm saying, to shift your attention up there, well, and then back to me, based on your goal is to try and, you know, learn what I'm teaching and see if you can apply it to the case in a useful way. That's prefrontal cortex function. When we're under attack or highly stressed, that prefrontal cortex becomes impaired, and then it's the defense circuitry that is controlling attention, and we call that bottom up. Top down is this, you know, rational, what we call the executive functioning prefrontal cortex. Oh, where does it make sense to focus my attention? Bottom up is automatically attention is being deployed moment to moment in automatic involuntary ways that that very old defense circuitry is based on how it's appraising the situation. You know, what's gonna help you cope and survive moment to moment. And so under attack, the control of attention shifts to that defense circuitry. And again, this is something most of us have experienced. I'm putting it into brain terms, but um, this is things we've experienced. And is it, um, are there also, you've talked about habits and reflexes. Are, are survival reflexes a part of that? Yeah, and by survival reflexes, I mean things that are basically hardwired into our brains by millions of years of evolution. You don't have to learn these things, they're just baked in there. And these are things that automatically will come up in a reflexive <coughs> way when we're in a dangerous situation, when we're on attack, under attack. Now there's a variety of these that can arise. There's no guarantee that any particular reflex is gonna kick in, but these are things that evolution has selected to help us survive attack by larger predators, for example. And another part of that is not just reflexes, but you talked about habits, is that right? Yeah, habits. Again, we're mostly creatures of habit, and habits are things that we learn in the course of our life but that we don't have to think about, we don't have to deliberate about. They can just get queued up and implemented very rapidly within a fraction of a second by our brain. And so evolution selected for brains that when they're under attack, if a lion was to come running through that door and heading at me, if I stop to think and use my rational prefrontal cortex, I'm lunch, right? You stop to think and all that great smart stuff that allows us to create computers and, and all that, it's not much use when there's an animal coming right at you and you've got maybe a second or less to react. You've got to be able to shift to habits and reflexes because these can happen very rapidly without you having to think about it. So keeping in mind this habits and reflexes, you've previously written articles about uh, how victims 
sometimes respond, whether they fight or don't fight, yell or don't yell, resist or mm -hmm. don't resist. Is that, is that, can you elaborate, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we've all heard this phrase, fight or flight, right? It's out there in the culture, we absorb it from a pretty young age. And what I try to help people understand is that's actually not such a helpful way of understanding how we respond to being attacked. Because in many situations, especially situations of sexual assault where people are mostly assaulted by people they know and thought they could trust, people don't always fight or yell. Uh, they don't always try to run out of the room. But their brain does shift to habits and reflexes. So habits and reflexes is how the brain works. Now, you could habitually fight. Maybe if you wrestled with your brothers when you were growing up a lot and you have these habits of struggling if someone's trying to hold you down on a couch or something, yeah, you might access that habit. Or you might reflexively fight in that kind of cornered animal syndrome. Um, but in terms of how the brain works, most of the time people don't do those things when they're being sexually assaulted, for example. But their behavior can be understood in terms of reflexes and habits. And sometimes the habits, often they're, they're passive habits um, that people learn uh, from how to deal with aggressive and dominant people, that they may learn from child abuse experiences, or that girls and women often learn in our culture about how to politely resist unwanted sexual advances without escalating things and causing a scene. So people have habits that they fall back on but they're often not involving fight or flight. So that's why I say the brain circuitries are the, the, the reflex circuitry and the habit circuitry, and the behaviors uh, may not be fight or flight at all, but sometimes they are. I've heard the expression uh, uh, fight, fl flight, or freeze. Have you heard that as well? Yes, of course. How does that apply in here? Is that what you're talking about, or is that? It doesn't same? really help that much. Adding another F word doesn't really help, I don't think. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, because there's so many more responses that people can have, okay. right? So people can passively resist out of habits of submission that they may have learned as a child, or being bullied on the playground or, or in a family violence situation. Um, so people don't necessarily fight, freeze, or flee, um, but they are, they are going to be reacting in terms of habits and reflexes. Now, freezing is a reflexive response. Freezing is a reflex that evolution has put into our brains. So that if, say, a lion was to come through that door and it wasn't maybe heading all the way at me, I might stop. I don't have to think, oh, it makes sense to stop here, right? It's not a prefrontal cortex thing. It's just everything will stop. And whatever I was thinking or saying to you guys, all that stuff basically gets flushed out of my brain. And now I've got an open mind to receive information about where this attack is coming from and maybe to start assessing for escape routes. And again, this happens in fractions of a second, but that's the basic freeze response. Stop everything, don't move, and start receiving information and possibly, hopefully, generating some responses to get out of there. And so this is something that happens. Um, it's often the first reflex response that kicks in when people detect that they are being sexually assaulted or that they are under attack in some way. And it may last just a half second or it may last several seconds. It really depends. But that's a reflex response. Can a, a person under attack go from responding in a habitual way to responding in a reflexive way or back and forth? Is it one or the other or is there a a particular order that this needs to go in? Over the course of a, an assault or a combat situation, uh, people can go through many different reflex and habit behaviors. Freezing is often the first one. And again, it may last just a fraction or a second or it may last longer. Um, that is often followed by some habit behaviors. Um, and, you know, again, often passive habits, often not fight or flight behaviors, but sort of passive, polite resistance that's ineffective. And then what we sometimes see in, in, in sexual assault and other assault cases is when, the situ when those habit behaviors are not working, it's, and especially if someone is now being pinned down and they feel like they can't escape or they're fearing for their life, or um, maybe now they're being penetrated in a way that they were trying to avoid and ward off, then some really extreme survival reflexes can kick in. And again, these aren't always about fighting. Um, sometimes people become literally paralyzed and their muscles become rigid and they cannot move or speak even if they try. That's a survival reflex that evolution put into our brains because when a predator has you in its jaws, its brain is waiting 
for your body to wriggle and struggle to release the next program, which is kill. And then after the killing, there's another program that runs in the predator's brain, eat. And so our brains co-evolved with predator's brains. And our brains evolved to deprive the predator of those what we call releasing stimuli. A, a paralyzed, frozen body literally in, can save your life sometimes because the predator doesn't get the wriggling body that then cues it to go to the next stage and kill. And so that's one example of no one's fighting, no one's fleeing, they're paralyzed, they can't do anything. It's an extreme survival reflex. But sometimes people can reflexively fight as well. Is that, an, uh, you talked about uh, extreme survival instinct. That a reflex, I wouldn't call reflex. it instinct. We don't okay. use I that in neuroscience, yeah. I apologize. Um, fighting or resisting uh, or escaping, can that be a part of that as well? Yeah, sometimes people can reflexively fight. If it's a if it's a reflexive fighting response, that can be you know a very extreme response. And this is something that's been studied in animals and where it works in the brain stem and how there's a switch that can get flipped, and then it can just be a complete rage kind of you know not that organized of a response, but people are flailing around in, in that sort of way often in those cases. Can it change um, based upon the the unsuccessfulness of the previous reflex or the previous habit? Yeah, so the, you know, we're talking about this, you know, we're thinking about this rationally and trying to understand it with our prefrontal cortexes, but as events are unfolding, whether it's, you know, being pinned down in an ambush in Kandahar or being pinned down in a couch or in the backseat of a car or wherever it might be, in these situations, people's defense circuitry takes over and the defense circuitry is making moment to moment judgments, you could say, of how to respond in this situation. And they can be very confusing and baffling to people afterwards. Many sexual assault survivors are embarrassed and ashamed, or they think like, they'll never believe me if I tell them I was paralyzed and couldn't move even though I tried. And unfortunately, sometimes police won't believe them because they don't know about this. And that's why I'm out there training police about these things all the time to help them know. So these responses can happen without any choice, automatically, they can be very confusing to the person in the midst of the experience and afterwards. And it really depends on what their defense circuitry is appraising moment by moment is going to help with coping and surviving in that situation. And the, I would imagine the research supports that the individual response is unique to that individual, typically. To some, yeah, to some yeah, so there's, there's parameters that evolution has set, right? The defense circuitry is going to kick in and take over. It's going to shift you to the habit and reflex circuitries of your brain. But which habits, which reflexes, when, that's a function potentially of the genetics of the person. Some of us would be more likely to go into that paralyzed mode than others. Um, some of us are more likely to freeze for a longer period of time than others. So it could be genetics. Um, it could be aspects of the actual situation you're in. It could be your history of childhood abuse or not and how someone responded to those situations. So there's a whole variety of factors, some just set by evolution and then some shaped by your individual life and then some shaped by the situation you're in as it's unfolding moment by moment. In a person in this situation, when the defense circuitry takes control, is that, no, you just need to think harder. You just, you, you can become rash. I mean, is it, is it, possible to, to short of what you talked about the, the perhaps special forces training to like engage the prefrontal cortex in that situation it's it's very difficult because it's our prefrontal cortex you know some of the other functions of the prefrontal cortex would be what you would allow you to do that so just a couple of them these are called executive functions of the prefrontal cortex one of them is to pay you know focus your attention based on where it makes sense to as I was talking about in a rational way another one is to be able to draw in memories and plans and reason things out. When your prefrontal cortex is impaired, you can't do that. You can't think, oh, if I do this, then that will happen. You don't have that ability to, to deliberate rationally about what to do. And then also, the prefrontal cortex is what allows us, in part, to monitor our behaviors and is this working? Are the signals I'm getting from the environment telling me this is working or not? And then if the signals are it's not working, then the prefrontal cortex can allow you to shift to an entirely new strategy, to shift out of that habitual or impulsive response to another one. But if your prefrontal cortex is impaired, you don't have any of those functions. And so people will sometimes persist 
in utterly ineffective passive behaviors in the context of being sexually assaulted all the way up to the person who's raping them. They're just saying, you're married, you don't need to be doing this. You're married, you don't need to be doing this. Like these polite phrases, passive behaviors. People will persist in these because they don't literally don't have the prefrontal cortex capacity to say, this isn't working, I gotta try something else. I would imagine in your work and in your training, sometimes perhaps you're approaching somebody says, well, that's not what I would do in that situation. Have you ever heard that expression? Yeah, and I say, well, that's, that's your prefrontal cortex talking. I mean, <laughs> if you're in the situation, you know, you don't know what you're going to do until you're there. And police and soldiers totally understand this. You know, they get training to go into combat and they can get really great training. But still, in that first battle or that first battle where their buddy gets his head blown off right in front of them, uh, they might not be able to rely on that training. They might not function as they think they would or as they did in the previous couple battles. And it can be a very humbling experience. You know, we all have our breaking points, even the best trained soldiers. So is it, is it, I guess I don't know how to phrase it other than, is it fair to think in the safety of this analysis to say, well, I wouldn't have done that? Is that something you, you think is a rational question to ask under that situation? I mean, people can't help but ask those questions, but part of what I try to do is educate people to think about, you know, what the limits might be on your ability to respond to these situations and how it might have nothing to do with your plans or even, you know, even if you've got some self-defense training, it may not kick in. The older reflex stuff may dominate, not some new habits that you had and that you thought you would be able to use in the situation. So we've been talking about behavior in uh, the defense circuitry. Does it also uh, apply to, to memory? Yeah, so this circuitry, um, especially the amygdala, this is a place where the amygdala does play a huge role. The amygdala has huge effects on how the circuitry we call the episodic memory circuitry, it's just a fancy name for a circuitry in our brain that allows us to take in events, experiences we're having, encode them into short-term memory, and then potentially store them in long-term memory. So there's this circuitry called the episodic memory circuitry, and a key structure in that is called the hippocampus. Strange name, but that's what it's called. And the amygdala can have huge effects on how the hippocampus functions, again, within a second or two. And, then it, and that can change how the hippocampus is taking in and potentially storing away parts of the experience that you're having. And then those, experience, those influences of the amygdala and the hippocampus can change over time as well. They can have huge effects on what people are able to remember. We're going to go into memory a little bit more in detail, but just for the slide, the point was, I think you are making the defense circuitry alters behavior as well as memory. Yeah, it alters the functioning of that memory circuitry in, in significant ways. Now you've, you've talked to us about the prefrontal cortex. Is the, is, do I need to push the next button here to... Yeah, just show where it is. Yeah, so that's... This is what we call a glass brain. We often use these to teach about the brain. You can kind of see through it. The folded stuff around the outside is called cortex. This emerged last of all in evolution. It's most highly developed in intelligent mammals and primates and, and us. And it's got this folded pattern. And engineers who've looked at this said, boy, you couldn't come up with a better structure to like pack in a lot of brain cells and help them communicate and, and co compute things really efficiently. And so it's a, it's a wonder of evolution. And in the front, behind our forehead and above our eyes, is the part called the prefrontal cortex. And this emerged last of all in evolution, even of cortex. And even within an individual human life, it doesn't fully develop until we're in our 20s. And so this is something the media now, you hear, you'll hear about how you know, it doesn't fully develop until you're in your 20s and adolescents have the raging hormones, but their prefrontal cortex isn't so good at managing that stuff. So this is, this is that area of our brain that I talked about. It has these executive functions, like paying attention rationally, reasoning things out, monitoring if your behavior is effective, and if not, shifting to a new behavioral strategy. Those are all functions of the prefrontal cortex. They're, allow, they're what allow us to be fully human. They're what allow us to live up to our morals and our values and our relationships with our children and our spouse and people we work with. When, when our buttons get pushed and we get upset, if we're not too upset, hopefully our prefrontal cortex can remind us, okay, how do I want to be here as a father? How do I want to be here as a spouse? These are rational capacities that we 
depend on having at times in order to you know be rational moral human beings so you talked about the defense circuitry is there also then the, the episodic mem memory circuitry yeah so that's what i mentioned before so this is a circuitry that's very well studied a key structure in that i'm showing where it is in, in green there it's called the hippocampus and uh it just, it's a circuitry that plays a really fundamental role in taking experiences in. So, you know, we're all sitting here. We have experiences in this courtroom. We can look around. We can see different people. We're hearing different things. This hippocampus especially is playing a role in taking some parts of that experience and encoding them into short-term memory, kind of like a RAM in our brains, and then prioritizing some of what we're taking into short-term memory to be stored into long-term memory, maybe because it might be useful later. So this is a very well-studied circuitry. There's a whole journal called Hippocampus, which is just you know thousands of studies over the years just on the hippocampus, and a lot of those are its involvement in memory. So yeah, and the red dot. Yeah, yeah the, red the red dot. dot on there? So the red dot is that structure, the amygdala, which you've probably heard of much more than the hippocampus, and that sits close to the hippocampus in this area of the brain called the medial temporal lobe. And it has huge impacts on the hippocampus. When stress kicks in or when an attack is detected, it has very big impacts on how that hippocampus functions to take things in and potentially store them away or not. And so that's something that we can talk more about. When attack is detected, is that a key moment? Yes, because that's when that defense circuitry kicks in and it's releasing chemicals, it's, rele it's doing things, uh, releasing chemicals through the adrenal bland, dr gland in the body that are feeding back on the brain. I mean, I don't want to get into all those details. I don't think it would be helpful. But the amygdala, very rapidly, and then over time, through chemical and electrophysiological processes, alters the functioning of that hippocampus in ways that can have huge effects on how someone remembers, whether it's a sexual assault or witnessing a murder or being involved in a murder or being in a combat situation, how they encode and store that memory is very affected by the, by the amygdala. And you previously mentioned uh, bottom-up, yeah. right? And how is that related to, to memory here? So, again, we can think of it in terms of top-down versus bottom-up. Top-down is this prefrontal cortex. What does it make sense to focus on here? What am I trying to learn? How might this be useful in the role I'm playing here in this trial? That's top-down. Bottom-up would be if an IED exploded in the corner of that room and suddenly we were all fearing for our lives. Now what would be determining how our attention was deployed? It wouldn't be our prefrontal cortex so much anymore because that's going offline pretty much within a couple of seconds. And so the defense circuitry takes over and then different people may be focusing on different parts of the experience. That so that's bottom-up attention. It's that defense circuitry controlling where attention goes moment to moment in order to cope with and survive that situation. I think on the slide here it says uh, defense circuitry focuses on what seems most important. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so you know, one of the ways this has been studied uh, is what we call weapon focus. And this is something police officers know about. Anybody who's worked a bunch of mugging cases, if someone's held up at gunpoint, give me your money or with a knife, often a victim of a, a mugging like that, they're involuntarily their attention will get stuck on that knife or that gun. And then it'll be really hard for them to later remember, you know, facial features of the perpetrator, maybe what it said on their sweatshirt, you know, what kind of hairstyle they had. Because involuntarily that bottom-up attention driven by the defense circuitry was being captured by that knife or that gun, or maybe the look in the guy's eyes that could telegraph whether he was actually going to, you know, you know, shoot or stab them. And so that's an example. Or like I said, if the bomb went off in here, all of our attention would be captured by different aspects of that experience. Maybe the sounds of people screaming, maybe wounds that we had in our own body, maybe, you know, the, the doorway over here as we headed for the door. That's bottom-up attention. It's automatic. You don't think about it. You don't reason it out. It's just involuntary to survive and cope moment to moment. I think on here you have attended is the central details equals encoded. And so I think there's a lot there. And you, you, yeah. you just basically talked about the attended portion of it. Right. right. Yeah. So tell me about central details. You talk about uh, a gun in somebody's face. It seems obvious to, to me, maybe to others, 
that that would be the central detail. Is, is that always the central detail? Tell us about central details. Right. So central details are not what we assume would be the central detail. Now the gun, that kind of makes sense to us, right? But it's what that person's brain, what their defense circuitry focused on moment to moment. And this term central details, this comes from research on memory that goes back decades. It's a distinction between central and peripheral details. Central is what gets attention and has significance attached to it, emotional or survival significance. What doesn't get attention or doesn't have significance attached to it, we call those peripheral details. They're much like, less likely to get encoded, let alone prioritized and stored away. So this is always true, right? You're all listening to me. You're not paying 100% attention every second to everything I say. We're only human, right? Some things seem more significant to some of you than others. Some things are capturing your attention more. Those are for you the central details. And what may have been a peripheral detail for you, someone else may have thought, ooh, that's really significant, and wrote down a note on it or something, for some reason given who they are or what they're focusing on. So central is all about the experience of the person who's, whether it's in combat or a sexual assault or anything else, what they're experiencing moment to moment, what is a focus of attention, and what has significance attached to it by their brain, especially their defense circuitry. And what doesn't have that, we call that peripheral, and that stuff either doesn't get in, or if it gets in, it tends to fade really fast. And so this is just how memory works. In situations of high stress, yeah. Apologies, let me interrupt you for a second. Just to, I've heard, you know, we've all, I think, heard the, the peripheral vision, right? Does right. is it, is it mean things that are out here I'm not gonna pay as much attention to or remember as much, or is that just, is that a poor analogy? How is it related? I mean, to that's that? analogous, but it doesn't really capture it. So let's go back to the mugging example. Someone's got a gun pointed at you. Now some people, their attention will just be captured by that gun. Sometimes people will be so afraid, they will go into a state we call a dissociative state, and they might space out and feel like they leave their body, and they might focus on a spot on the ceiling. Now that spot on the ceiling is their central detail from then on, however long they're focused on it. And they may not have any memory at all of you know, how that gun was being waved around or even things the, 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 the mugger was saying to them if they went into this dissociative state. And so that's just an extreme example. But what's central and peripheral is purely a function of that person's brain moment to moment grabbing onto some parts but not other parts of the experience. And we can't really assume what's going to be central and what's going to be peripheral. And in fact, this is something I teach police all the time is don't assume what would be central and peripheral. And what we see so often in uh, police officers who maybe don't have as good training as, as we might want, they have some preconceived ideas about what are the, should be the central details that are totally disconnected from what were the central details for the, for the victim or for the suspect they're interviewing. And, and so there's a lot of lost information and there's sometimes leading questions or pushing for details that the investigator assumes, well, of course they would have noticed this but it might have been a peripheral detail. And so this is often a cause of problems in investigations, and one of the things I, you know, I'm trying to help with around the country and around the world to help investigators understand just because you think it's central and to your investigation doesn't mean it was a central detail for that person's brain moment to moment as this was happening. It might have been peripheral. So let me just pause for a second. I'm not sure there might be a Jeff, question from a juror. I need to take somebody home, just to the bathroom. Okay, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we take a... And we'll take a 10 minute recess, okay? And uh, then throw someone else us as well. All right, uh, Mr. Nelson, uh, you may continue with your direct examination. Thank you. And Dr. Hopper, before the break, we were talking about again the uh, central details in memory. Yeah. Before we move on, uh, are there different stages of memory? Yes, there are. Are, the, um, are there three stages? Yes, memory researchers typically think of memory as having three different stages of processing. What's the first stage? Uh, encoding is the first stage. Tell us about that. What's encoding? So encoding is taking the things that you're experiencing as they're happening, like right now, and your brain literally putting them in, holding on to them in a certain way um, and, and taking them in. Just 
So the hippocampus, as I mentioned, plays a really important role in this. So this is what we call short-term memory, things get encoded into short-term memory. It's just a brief, like, 30-second buffer of what we're experiencing now and what we've maybe experienced in the last 30 seconds, and it's being held or represented by groups of brain cells in the, in the brain. Is the, what's the second stage? The second stage is storage. And so that's what of the information that got encoded then gets stored away. Not everything that gets encoded into short-term memory gets stored in long-term memory, only some of it. And so there's a whole science on what determines how things get from short-term memory encoding into long-term memory storage. And I think we're going to talk more about it later, but what's the, what's the third stage? Uh, retrieval or recall. What, it sounds uh, obvious from the word, but just tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's, that's the act of bringing things that have been stored in long-term memory, or potentially short-term, but usually long-term we're talking about, being able to activate them and bring them into awareness, where then you can notice them and then potentially put them into words and tell other people about them. So the three stages are encoding, storage, and retrieval. Yes. Um, up on the slide here, we've got uh, the word encoded. How is that related to attended central detail equals encoded? What do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, so, so what we pay attention to and, and, and what our brain attaches significance to, that's more likely to get encoded into short-term memory. Like there's all kinds of things that, are, that we're hearing and, 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 and seeing here and that you may be experiencing in your bodies or thoughts running around in your heads about other things. But only some of that is going to get your attention and seem significant to you as we're going through this experience, and that's going to get encoded into, into memory. Is that, um, when the brain's under attack, is the encoding time dependent as well? Yeah, so encoding and storage, yes. So remember, encoding is just short-term memory. It's only like a 30-second buffer, and then some of that stuff gets stored away and retained in the brain. And so the effects of stress on the encoding and storage of memory, um, it takes, it kind of amplifies what's always already going on. Our brain is always filtering for what's significant and what's not, what's getting more attention and what's less. It's always filtering central and peripheral. And when you add stress into it, the, the stress and, and the amygdala affects that hippocampus in ways that really change how information is being encoded, and it changes that over time. And the next slide here you have in the bottom left corner, uh, attack detected. How does, is that, a, is that an important moment? Yeah, and you, we could also put there, you know, when the stress kicks in, um, because in memory research, right, we're not, researchers are not at physically or sexually attacking people in the laboratory, right? But they are having them do things that people can find really stressful, like they have to give an impromptu speech in front of a bunch of strangers who look at you with a stone face like there's something wrong with you. Most people find that pretty stressful. And they can measure the stress hormones in their body and things like that. So stress and, as I said before, stress and fear and terror are on a continuum. But they involve the same chemicals in the same circuits of the brain. And so, you know, when we're talking about sexual assault or physical assault or you're in combat and suddenly you hear that sniper fire coming or the IED goes off, that's what we're talking about. When, when suddenly the brain goes into a very different state when it's recognizing that it's under attack. And in that state, is there something that happens called super encoding? Yeah, so basically what we're going to see here is a, a graphic that comes from decades of research on people and animals using all kinds of different methods. And what researchers have found who study how stress affects memory and who are, you know, the best and really doing this well and looking at the time aspects of it, they found that the brain temporarily when an attack is detected or when stress really kicks in, it goes into a mode where it can take in more information per unit time, basically. The hippocampus can go into what we can call a super encoding mode. That's a phrase I use for it, to, you know, for lay people. Um, and basically, it's, you know, 
if, if you look on the, what we call the y-axis, right, going up and down, normal encoding would be how our hippocampuses are working now. Um, we're not under high stress. We're also not like totally wiped out and exhausted, hopefully not yet. Um, and, but when, when stress kicks in or when an attack is detected, there's this temporary um, hit of, of stress chemicals and processes going on in the hippocampus that put it into a mode where it can take in more information. Now it's still taking in based on what's getting attention and significance. It's not necessarily taking in things that are getting no attention or significance to them. So there's still that central versus peripheral thing going on, but more information can get um, taken in. And it can get not just taken in, but really like burned into the brain. And so that's something that has been found over and over again in all kinds of studies of people and animals, that if you stress someone and then you have them learn a list of words or watch a movie or something like that, right after the stress hits, they're gonna remember that better than if they weren't stressed right before that because it changes how this memory circuitry is working. So it can take in more information and burn it in better. How is that super encoding related to central details versus peripheral details? So again, it's gonna, it's gonna really, the term in the research we call it over consolidation, things get consolidated into long-term memory storage. And during this phase, the central details, they get an extra boost literally an extra boost from norepinephrine and, and cortisol, and, and, and people have worked out a lot of the details of this. So there's actual chemicals that are affecting the hippocampus in ways that are even more strongly storing those central details than they normally would. Is there a differential between those central details versus the peripheral details in this super encoding mode? Yeah, the, the peripheral details are still getting much less um, uh, chemical processes and things to, to, to preserve them. But it, the differential encoding of the central versus peripheral is am amplified. Could somebody in this super encoding, I'll call it mode, is that a fair term? Sure. In the super encoding mode, have a particular image burned but might be missing other parts? Yeah, definitely. I mean, they're more likely to take in more pieces that they're paying attention to during this phase. But still, that, that basic dynamic of some things are getting more attention and significance than others, um, that's still operating. How long does this super encoding mode last? So I can't tell you exactly three minutes or five minutes or whatever. There's a lot of research um, where people are pretty significantly stressed in a laboratory, but it's not the level of stress from being assaulted or shot at in combat or something like that. And so often a 20 minute time period is used there. But we see um, in some other studies and in just practical experience that it appears this phase can sometimes last as few as like three to five minutes. And there's um, researchers who are looking at how that can be a function of people's genetics, how it can be a function of what phase of a menstrual cycle and, and hormonally a woman is in. Um, and so there's a variety of things that can and that can feed into this, and including potentially just how stressed you are. That there's some evidence that that can squeeze this, um, and you you move out of this super encoding phase faster if you're super stressed. But there's no like exact number because there's a, m a bunch of variables that feed into it. Does a super encoding mode last as long as the stress does, or is there some physiological limit to the super encoding mode? There's a limit. I mean, some stressors are really short, of course, um, but many you know combat and physical assaults and sexual assaults last longer than five or 10 or 15 minutes. And so yeah, it can, it can really depend. Now one of the things that happens when it goes into the super encoding mode, um, in order to do that, there's a lot of research showing that these brain cells in the hippocampus, they have a literally like a receptor and a channel that allows it to flow into that brain cell calcium. Calcium is part of what helps it go into the super encoding mode but calcium is toxic to brain cells. So it's an, it's an unsustainable state. And there's many things in the biology that work this way. It goes to an extreme that can have some functions, but if you hang out in the extreme too long, it's gonna hurt you. And so that's the understanding from the top researchers who do this work, who I've talked to, that, and the publications, that to go into that super encoding mode, one of the key things is it has to take in calcium to these cells. But then at some point it has to get that calcium out or it's going to damage those cells and they're not going to be able to encode or store anything. So what happens after the super encoding mode? Well, that's when it goes into what we can call the minimal encoding mode. 
But as that calcium is being pushed out, and as the brain is, and the, and the circuitry is now, its resources are devoted to storing the stuff that came in initially. And it got tagged as really significant at the beginning. Because it, it doesn't have the capacity, once the calcium is pushed out, it can't do as much, and it's prioritizing that early stuff. And again, this is something that's been you know, seen repeatedly in all kinds of different studies of humans and animals, this, this basic curve up into the superencoding and then down into the minimal encoding. So it's, taking, it's able to take in less information and it's able to take in especially less complex information. So it's one thing to remember you know, a knife being held in your face or a pain that you felt in, from a scratch from the knife on your chest or something like that. It's another thing to remember how those things unfolded in time. That literally requires more computational power from your brain, from the hippocampus and other structures to encode, well, that piece and that piece and that piece, those central details, how were they arrayed in time? And when it goes into this minimal encoding mode, that's much more difficult to do. And again, this isn't just about sexual assault or, or you know, murder situations. This is combat. Soldiers know this. Their commanders know this. Often people have very vivid memories for just as the attack got underway. And then you know, five minutes, ten minutes into that firefight or that battle, things get really jumbled. And when they go back to tell their commander, you know, they may disagree about what happened before or after what. And the commander doesn't say, well, I don't believe anything you're saying about this. You're not credible. They know this is how memory works. They may not know all the science behind it, but they know that often it's that initial stuff that really gets burned in, and then things can get pretty jumbled after that. So why would, why would our brains evolve in that way? So the way I always teach about this is that, you know, we evolved as both predators and prey. And, you know, now we're, most of us are pretty safe and don't have to worry about um, predators, but from an evolutionary perspective, and even in some places, if you were to drop us into certain forests or jungles, we'd be pretty vulnerable to larger predators. And the name of the game, when you're smaller and weaker than the predators that can kill and eat you, um, is to be able to predict where predators are going to be and avoid getting attacked in the first place. So the, the thinking on this is that when an attack is detected, if you're lucky enough to survive it, our, our brains evolved, the one, those of our ancestors who survived, their brains were shaped to go into the super encoding mode and to burn in whatever was in that 30 second short term memory and whatever happens right at the beginning of that because that might be really important predictive information later. But what happens like once that line is on me, if I get lucky and poke it in the eyes or whatever, that's a crapshoot for the most part, for most of us. And so evolution selected for brains that are going to be able to burn in stuff that might predict and help you avoid attack in the future. And that's what the, uh, the last slide here is, the, what you just testified about, right? Yeah, the prediction is survival in, in nature, and, and you know, neuroscience really is emphasizing this, just how important the predictive nature of so many of the things our brain does is, and that includes memory functioning under stress or under attack. And, and it's, so it's burning in that predictive stuff and prioritizing that for storage uh, after it's pushed out that calcium that could be harmful. So now on the, on the last slide here, it has up there the word gist. What, what do you mean by gist? How is that related to the slides that we just talked about in memory? Sure. So I've, I've talked about this idea of central versus peripheral details that is always happening all the time. We're focusing on some things and having them be more significant than others to our brain. And then the peripheral stuff isn't getting in or it's getting lost very quickly. GIST is a different concept that, that's related. GIST is like, it's just a basic, high-level, abstract description. So like, I, you know, on the 10th day or whatever this is of this trial, this guy Hopper came in and talked about memory, and I didn't absorb all of it, but, you know, some of it made sense, you know, something like that. That would be like a GIST-level description or memory of what happened to you, say, in a week from now or two weeks or a month from now. And you may remember a couple things I said um, that really stuck with you, that were like central details for you. And so this is how memory is organized. Most of our memories from the past, when we remember things in the past, we don't remember everything about what happened, right? All kinds of stuff, we don't remember it because it didn't get attention in the first place or because it's long since faded. Even some central details are gonna fade over time, six months, a year, 20 years later. But the gist of what happened, we don't tend to forget that. We don't tend to forget, you know, I was driving down the, the road and someone came across the double line and hit my car. 
you know, I may remember a couple central details and the gist. And so I use this tree image to capture that the, the gist is just like the basic description of what happened with a few central details. It's like the trunk of the tree and like the big branches on it. But, you know, the little branches and all the leaves, those are the peripheral details and even some of the central details are just going to eventually blow away and be gone. Um, and so all memory is reconstructive. We're, we don't remember like a videotape, right? We try to reconstruct things based on the gist of what we remember happened and some of those central details. And that's how we're always remembering things when we're trying to. So, uh, Madam Clerk, I'm done with the, the screen. Thank you. So you've talked about encoding. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about storage, but before I get into the third stage retrieval, yeah. how do, what, what's the bridge between encoding and retrieval? Tell us about storage. So storage is when some of the stuff that got encoded in a short-term memory makes it into longer-term memory. And there's biochemical and electrical processes that are involved in that. And our brains evolved to prioritize some information over other to get that storage because it could be significant and helpful to us later. So I want to talk to you now about the third stage, retrieval. Mm -hmm. So if something gets encoded and, and what got encoded gets stored, yeah. how is retrieval different? Yeah, it's really important <laughs> not to confuse these things because just because information got very well stored in someone's brain doesn't necessarily mean they're going to retrieve it in any particular situation. Things can be burned into your brain, but you may not retrieve or recall them as a function of the situation you're in or what we call context and cues. Does, what impact, if any, does stress have on that retrieval process? Yeah, so this is something that's you know been studied for, for years now. Basically, stress impairs retrieval. So people can have things that are in their memory and stored in long-term memory, but they may not be able to retrieve them because they're stressed. And, you know, we won't get into all the details, but there's definitely some good neurobiological research on that as well. Um, it's, just, it's just a very well-known phenomenon, and the neurobiology is being worked out. And is... We've heard, you've probably heard the expression, you know, somebody's memory improved over time. Right. What, what would you have to say about that? Yeah, so what's stored in memory, that never improves over time, right? Peripheral details are fading, even some central details are being lost. But people's ability to retrieve information, that can improve over time. And so no one's saying, you know, no scientist is saying that, you know, what's stored in memory gets better. But our capacity to retrieve what's still in there, that can improve over time. And one of the things that can help it improve is if we become less stressed over time. So often in investigative interviews, as soon after a crime, a person can be really stressed by what they went through or maybe the stress of talking to a police officer or they fear is you know, not going to understand or believe them. That can be pretty stressful. And that can make it hard for people to retrieve and tell the police officer about things that are actually in their brain. So that's one way it can happen. So in, in many ways, it's a stress is a barrier to being able to go and retrieve what you've already stored. Yeah, and this is something that, you know, people who study, you know, effective interviewing methods and even the national security community, the CIA, the DIA, for the last, like, 10 years, they've been doing a lot of work on how having an adversarial attitude and approach with a suspect or a high-value de detainee, you know, a terrorist, it's not going to help you get the information you want. You don't want them being stressed out. And it's not like they do it on TV. So you talked about before uh, context and cues. How does retrieval depend upon context and cues? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so context and cues, this is, you know, again, terminology from memory research, you know, decades of people using these concepts. If you want to remember something, it's easier to remember it in the context in which it happened, right? So sometimes we'll be thinking about something in one room of our house, and then we'll go into the other room, and we'll be like, wait, what was I trying to remember to do? And sometimes you might go back into that other room, and like, oh yeah, it comes back to you. So there's a ways in which when we're having experiences, right, you're having experiences now of me in this courtroom. 
If next week someone was to ask you about things I said, you know, again, you're not going to remember all of them. But if you were to be brought back in, <coughs> sat down in the same seat, putting you back in the context in which you heard what I was saying, that's going to make it easier for you to remember some things because it puts your brain and your body in the state, in a state that's similar to the one you were in when you had the experience in the first place. And that's the name of the game with retrieval. You want to help people get their brain and their body in a state that resembles the one where they took in the information because that's going to make it easier to get it back out again. And so the context can be where you are in the room in your house or in the courtroom or in the situation you're in, being in, talking to a police officer, for example, in an investigative interview, that's a context. It can be quite a difficult and scary one. The context can also be the state of your own brain and body. Stress is a context. If you're stressed out, that's a context too. So before you were talking about these external contextual cues that are based on the environment, for lack of a better term. Yeah. But there's also these internal context clues that are going on for that particular person. Yes, and, that, and that, another term for that is you know, state-dependent memory. The early studies were if you, state dependent memory. If you study for a test to drinking coffee, then you should drink coffee before you take the test. Because it, your brain is going to be in a similar state when you're trying to retrieve the information as it was in when you encoded it. And so that's an internal context of the state of your brain and body. And that can facilitate retrieval as well. Or if it's at odds with the context at the time, it can make it harder to retrieve information. Does that mean if... Uh the information you're trying to retrieve was from a stressful situation. You'd want to improve. You'd want to put the person in a contextually stressful situation in order to line that up. Well, so you know, this is where things can get complicated, and where police officers have very difficult jobs. Um, so, in general, you don't want to be stressing someone because stress on its own impairs retrieval. But sometimes the it can be stressful. For example, to take someone back to a crime scene. But the benefits of being in that context of the crime scene can outweigh the stress. And also, if they were really stressed in the crime scene and they feel sort of like that, it can facilitate retrieval. So yeah, things can get complicated. But in general, stress impairs retrieval. But in some cases, if the stress matches the original experience, it may facilitate retrieval. And um, so that's context. You also talked about... Um Retrieval of function of being context and cues. cues. What do you mean by cues? So cues is just a you know a scientific term for things that can remind you. So you know most of the things we remember in our lives, we don't remember them because we're searching for them. We remember them because like we hear a song on the radio that reminds us of some ex-girlfriend, or we you know we see a sign, a billboard that reminds us you know of our child and when they were in first grade or something like that. Right? These associations. There's things that just match memories that we have in our brain in some way, and it activates them. And these are called cues. And you know, a lot of them are things that you wouldn't even expect or maybe even notice consciously. There's just all kinds of things that are just popping up memories in our head all the time. And these are called retrieval cues. And in the context of investigations, every question that an investigator asks, whether it's a suspect or a victim or a witness, that's a retrieval cue. They're, they're, giving, they're asking them something that may or may not correspond to something that's in their memory. And depending on how they ask that question, and if it's on or off base, it may or may not facilitate retrieval. So based upon your experience and the research that, you know, that you've been doing either yourself or uh, <laughs> familiar with, are there effective practices for <coughs> interviewing again, suspects, victims, witnesses in order to uh, make sure that all of the retrieval context and cues are there, the best practices. Yeah, there's definitely work on that. And, a and, lot of work. And again, I know there's probably not a, a necessarily a list, but what are some of the what are some of the best practices that you're familiar with or that yeah. you would recommend? Yeah, so these are best practices that go back, you know, to the 80s. Uh, people who invented something called the cognitive interview, which has been used to train and help police officers um, interview people. And, and then there's child forensic interviewing, how to ask children questions, children who are reporting sexual abuse, so there's a suspicion. Um, and then 
um, techniques that have been developed to work with, uh, you know, again, in the national security community, uh, with terrorists and, and, and those people. Um, and that they all have common practices that the research and practice converge on. And so one of them is you don't want to be adversarial with the person you're talking to because that can stress them out and make them less cooperative and less likely and less able to retrieve the information you want. So you want to try and help them feel comfortable and safe and have a good, what they call, rapport with you. So that's one of the best practices. Another one is you really want to set things up so that they are do that the person you're interviewing is doing almost, almost all the talking. You don't want it to be question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. You want them to be doing all the talking and just freely, whatever comes into their memory, just telling you about it. And, and so that's a that, best practice. Why, why, is, why is it that you want to have it that the interviewer is doing less talking and the interviewee, the suspect, witness, victim, right. is doing all of the talking? Why is that? Because the information is in their brain, not yours as the investigator. And investigators, they wouldn't be interviewing you if they didn't know. Now, sometimes they do have crime scene evidence and things like that. But for the most part, they want to know what's in your head. And so... If they start asking questions, then those questions are often going to be based on misperceptions or misbeliefs they have about what happened and what you might remember. And there's a lot of research on this. And so people, just in general, people are vulnerable to not understanding or not knowing what's in the brain of the, the victim or the suspect, and they will tend to ask questions that actually aren't effective. The other thing is, if you just keep going back and forth with question, answer, question, answer, that gives the, the person you're interviewing the message that their job is to wait and answer your questions, when really their job is just to tell you everything possible about what they remember that you might not have any idea or expectation that is in their brain. And so one of the best practices is you first interview the person about something completely different totally neutral, so that you can kind of train them in what you're looking for, to just say whatever comes into their head, just keep talking about any sensation, any emotion, any sight, any sound, any smell, without you having to say anything. And then only after they've done a whole bunch of that, and you've shown them how to do that with a neutral memory, then you say, then they know, okay, that's how it's going to go. And then you start asking them about what you really want to know about. And then they know that they're not to sit and wait for you to ask them questions, but to just speak and just remember whatever pops into their head. It might be in order, it might be out of order, doesn't matter. This is how people have learned to, to get the most and the most accurate information, whether it's from a crime victim or from a terrorist um, detainee. Thank you. Judge, I just have a procedural question. I, I, I want to get out a flip chart and just write down some other matters here. I think it's probably five to ten more minutes and then that then I'd move on to the next section. I know it's two minutes to noon. Do you want to stop now? Do you want me to finish this a, a little bit? Yeah, maybe we should uh, I, I, I'm told that, uh, that lunch should be here at 12. It's close enough to that that it probably makes sense. A good natural spot to break. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, give you a recess and it'll probably be you know sometime shortly after 1 p.m. that we'll convene okay so we'll excuse the jury all rise Dr. Hopper prior to the lunch break uh, you were talking about what I think was a good interviewing methods for traumatized people is that a, sound about right uh, for traumatized people or for really anybody that you're wanting to get information from them, it could be a suspect who wasn't traumatized at the time or, yeah. Okay, is it more important or heightened or anything when, it's, when you're dealing with somebody who uh, may potentially be trauma, have been traumatized? So someone who has been assaulted or has been traumatized, um, they may be more vulnerable to... Um, to feeling afraid and stressed uh, in the interviewing context. And so it may be even more important to make sure you have a good rapport with them and they feel safe. Um, but again, these are general principles that are good across the board. Okay. Um, in the, and these are general principles good across the board uh, when you're trying to gather information? 
Yeah, when you're trying to gather information from someone else's memory from their brain. Because some interviews may have different goals in gathering information, right? Correct. Um, and so you're talking about in the context if you want to get something out of somebody else's head, for lack of a better term, this is the way to go about doing it, right? Yes. And I would imagine that on the, while there's um, what you've called good or best practices, perhaps, um, on the other side of the continuum, there's then some things to avoid. Would that be fair to say? Right. And again, these aren't just called best practices. There's lots of scientific research supporting that these, some practices lead to more complete and more accurate information and others are more likely to lead to less information and less accurate information. Okay. And um, you would, I think, uh, at least to me, but, uh, provided a list of some ineffective methods that are likely to reduce the amount of information and increase potential for inaccuracies. Is that right? Correct. And uh, you saw me write these down on a, on a poster board uh, that was some of the uh, potential ineffective methods. Is that right? Correct. Judge, no objection to receipt and publication of 718. So I'm showing you what's marked as 718. Is that that list that we just was mentioning? Is that yeah, I don't think we covered everything on that list yet, but yes. That's Correct. Yeah. All right. Hang on a second. Um, exhibit 718 will be received. Thank you. You may publish it. Thank you. And so, Dr. Hopper, I want to just go through this. As you said, some of these things have been covered in front of the jury. Some of them you've just perhaps told me so that we could, we could create that list. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And so, it, it could probably speak for themselves, and I know we're going to go through an interview here to have some examples of these, but if you can just highlight or briefly discuss Exhibit 718. Sure. So as you may recall, before lunch, I talked about in general how the, the best methods for getting information involve having the person who has the information in their head speaking as much as possible, so and not having to just respond to a bunch of questions though questions can be necessary, of course, at some point, very carefully. Um, and that one of the key things, too, is to first have the person practice the kind of recollection and reporting of memory that you're going to want for the crime or, or the victimization or whatever it is with a neutral memory so that they really know, like, oh, this is how it goes. I do all the talking as the person being interviewed, and I go into as much detail as possible about any sensations I remember, any thoughts I was having, everything and everything I can remember. Um, and so that's kind of the backdrop. And then the kinds of questions that the interviewer asks, so that first bullet there, what's called a leading question is something you definitely don't want to be doing. This is when, in, Included in the question itself is information that has not already been given to you by the victim or the suspect or whoever it might be, um, but that suggests what, how things might have been or what they might remember. So, you know, if you start asking them about, did you do this, and then you suggest something that, that hasn't been talked about before, that's a leading question. And there's, you know, there's various examples of that. But it's a question that contains information that can sort of bias what that person is likely to remember and might bias it away from actually the truth of what they remember. So let me stop you there, um, and then we're going to go back through the, the list here and over time. But um, in this case, um, you've reviewed other than just your general knowledge, you were provided information about some background. Is that fair to say? Yes, on this case, yes. Yeah, you've got, uh, in a leading form, I guess I'll ask you, you you've got police reports and recordings and uh, transcripts and information surrounding the events of March 22nd, March 23rd, and March 24th of 2018. Is that right? That's correct, yes. It includes, again, medical records and other information that... I think we have a list of that we might talk about later, but you've got lots of stuff, right? Yes. As part of that, um, did you have a chance to review a transcript of Ms. McCandless's second interview with Detective Proc dated March 24th, 2018? Yes, I did. 
created my own little barrier here. Uh, Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 290 and previously admitted is, you're familiar with that transcript? Yes. Um, so I want to, you, prior to your testimony today, you've read this, is that right? Yeah, many times. And you've uh, had an opportunity to point out some perhaps methods that uh, were not ideal. Would that be fair? Correct. So before we talk about this, um, I just want to, I mean, do you work with law enforcement officers? Yeah, I teach police officers all the time, and I have a great appreciation for the difficult job they have in investigating crimes and, and trying to get information from people. And so, yeah, I work with them a lot, and I try to help them out, and I really appreciate the difficulties they face. Um, but at the same time, uh, one of the reasons I teach them, and my colleagues do, and in interviewing methods, um, and the things that I teach, is to help them uh, be more effective at, at conducting interviews, with, especially with crime victims, which is what I focused on. Okay. So as we go through this, um, do you mean this as a, a we're going to go through this transcript and perhaps be critical of some of the things that were asked of Ms. McCandless by Detective Proc. Would that be fair? Yeah. Um, is it meant in the sense of blame or fault uh, or is it just meant in the context of here's how this may have impacted things? Yeah, it's just I'm here to basically shed light from what I know about how memory works and how effective interviewing works, um, not to cast judgment on anyone. Okay. And that's true here, that's true when I'm training police officers, I always make it very clear, like, I'm not here to judge anyone, I'm just here to help out. Okay. And so, I want to just go through some uh, particular parts of that transcript on page 16. I'm going to need the screen up, ma'am, Madam Clerk. Uh, line 688 to 692, I want to show you that, and I want to just focus it on here. Again, that's page 16, line 688 to 692. Oh. Can you see that? Yes. All right. And so, obviously, it speaks for itself, but can you just read the question and the answer? You want me to read the respondent and the answer? Yes, please. Okay. Out loud? Yes, please. Okay. So she says, and I don't really agree with the philosophies that much because they're just kind of, they're very negative philosophies. It's kind of like take any, like take as much as you want kind of philosophies and stuff like that. And what, is the, what does the interviewer say in response to that information that had been provided to him? He says, okay, but he's never harmed you physically. How does that, if at all, fall under your effective or ineffective methods of obtaining information from an interviewee? So that's a leading question. Okay. It's, 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 it's in the form of a question, but he's telling, saying, so he's never done this. He's suggesting the answer embedded in the question. Okay. And why is, what's the concern about that? In general, as, as I've said before, when you're interviewing someone and you want to get information from them, you don't want to be suggesting what information there is or what the answers are. You want to be asking open-ended, non-leading questions that are going to prompt them to retrieve things and hopefully tell you about them. Um, but you don't want to suggest what the answer is. You don't want to bias it in one way or another. And that is based upon... Everybody's been in court here for 12 days, and I imagine they've heard lots of leading questions. Are there... But you, you're not talking about courtroom leading. No, I mean questions. that's what attorneys do all the time, right? I mean, you know the answer you want, and you lead people down that path. But no, this is completely different. In investigative interviewing, you don't want to be doing that. Why not? Be because, again, as the interviewer, you don't know everything that's in that person's head, and if you are suggesting things, you may be pushing them away from really valuable information. They may not know the answer to. A a question or have that information, but they're trying to answer it, and they may then mix some things up because you're supplying them with the information. And there's lots of research on this, on, on leading questions, especially around what are called peripheral details. 
And so back in you know, the 80s and 90s, a lot of research by Elizabeth Loftus and others, that if you show people uh, films of car accidents, and, and then later you ask them questions about it, and you say, well, when it went through the stop sign, when that car went through the stop sign, and there was no stop sign, there was a yield sign, or there was no sign. But if you suggest and ask that leading question, when it went through the stop sign, did X happen? Then later, when they try to remember that experience, when you, you know, a week later you bring them back in the lab, sometimes people remember a stop sign when there was no stop sign. So these leading questions can bias and even distort people's memories, especially for things that they may not have noticed or they may have been peripheral details that have since faded. Okay. In, on this list here on Exhibit 218, you also have listed uh, failure to gather. Is this... Does this in any way uh, fall under a failure to gather? Well, maybe yes. Yeah. Yes. What do you mean by failure yeah. to gather? So, ideally, you want the person you're interviewing speaking just freely as much as possible. But then there are going to be some times where you need to ask questions. And when you do, you want your questions not to be leading. You want them to be open-ended, and they're often in the form of they. You tell them exactly what they just told you, and then you say. Tell me more about that. Tell me everything about that. So what would be an example? And that's, of, oh. What would be an example with this respondent's answer of a way to frame that question to gather information? I mean, you'd have to look at the whole context. I'm, if she's talking about, if she wants to talk about his philosophies and things like that, that's the frame of mind she's in. And so there's a real risk for you suddenly trying to switch from her talking about his philosophy, to her talking about his philosophies to his behavior. And so I would say that, you know, you want to, most, in most cases here, you would want to kind of go with what she's already talking about and say, you know, well, tell me, what do you mean, you know, the negative philosophies, tell me more about that. Okay. Thank you. And yep. then if at some point later it gets to, you know, actual physical things, you don't want to suggest yes or no that it happened. You want to ask open-ended questions about, you know, were there any times that, you know, some of these negative things were maybe acted on? Okay. Or something, you know, like that. Even, you know, as, as, limit, as less suggestive as possible. You don't want to suggest they did happen or they didn't happen. You want to just kind of leave it as an open question. And the purpose is, again, why should the purpose be to gather information as opposed to Put them into a box or get it going going in a certain direction what's the what's the importance of gathering information well the more information you have the more you're going to have to be able to compare to the other evidence you've collected and potentially to find things that may be uh, evidence of inconsistencies that are deceitful or something like that and the research shows that it doesn't just get you more information to avoid leading questions and, and to not fail to gather more information with these follow-ups of tell me everything about that, tell me more about that. It doesn't just get you more information, actually it leads to higher uh, confession rates. Okay. So it actually does achieve the goal, but not by trying to push that goal in a confrontational lead them into a box sort of way, which unfortunately you know, is still not an uncommon practice in a lot of places. It might be a... The way you were talking about gathering might be the longer route to get to the same place. Yeah, or maybe even you're more likely to get there because you take the longer route and you, you end up gathering way more information than you would have expected based on your you know, confrontational narrow plan. And, that's and then it'll help you maybe get there that you might not have gotten there through your confrontational narrow plan. And that's, that's an effective method whether the interviewee is being deceitful or truthful or anything in between. Definitely. And as I said, in the national intelligence commu community, uh, they learned this the hard way, and now they're, they're realizing even with, you know, high-value terrorist detainees, you are going for cooperation, rapport, and gathering as much information as you can, not just trying to do gotchas and trap them. Showing you then on page 17, you'd pointed out a section from line 728 to line 736. Is that, I'm going to lead you, is that an example of a leading question? Yeah, because he's suggesting the answer. The answer is never, you know, never. Right, so, it's, so clearly before this, she said something about putting his arm around her, and he's repeating that, 
But he's not repeating that and saying, tell me everything about that. Tell me more about that to collect more information about that. He's, he's going to another leading question about something different. He never punched you, like I said, or kicked you or slapped you or bit you. So he suggested the answer is no, but she actually comes out and says, well, he bit me once. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes people will resist leading questions. Certainly, that can happen. But, you know, you don't want to risk that. And the next example, I believe, is on the same page down to line 746 um, to 753. Is that, again, a, a leading question? I can't see anything. Oops. <coughs> yeah, definitely. He's he's the answer is built into the question and the answer is no, not no. Okay. And at some point, uh this is here is on uh page seventeen. Are you familiar with uh that part of the interview on March twenty fourth? Is that before uh Investigator Proc discloses that they found the car. Which part? That part? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then um, turning to page 40. Line 1788 to 1802. Just again, to put this into, for a context clue for us, is this, if you're familiar, is this right around where uh, Investigator Proc has now told her he's found the car? Yes, so yeah, on the page, page and a half before this, he's suddenly revealed to her that they found the car, they found his body. Okay, and now this section here, I'll just, maybe I'll just give everybody a time to read it, I don't Make you have to read through it. So the last portion of that on line eighteen oh two, the interviewer asks, Who did? Where does that fall in, uh, if at all, on the Exhibit 718, uh, whether it's an ineffective method or not? Well, you can compare it to the response he had before, which is, you know, mm-hmm. Like, that's actually a very useful response in many cases. It's basically saying, mm-hmm, I hear you, keep going. Um, whereas here, there's an interruption of the narrative to ask, who did? Now, for those of us reading it now, it's pretty clear she's talking about Alex. So I don't know if he was formulating his next question or what, but for some reason he didn't realize or wanted to ask, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what was going on in his head, but it's a question that interrupts the narrative um, in, at that point. And what's the, what's the concern that you have, or what is the research so, about interrupting the, the interviewee from giving the, the details, the information? Yeah, as I said before, you want them talking in as much detail as possible without it having to be in response to your questions because you don't really know how their memory is going to pop up and unfold in their head. And you want to give them as much freedom for that as possible. And what we would really have wanted to see here is when he switches gears to asking about, okay, we've, we've got the car, we've got the body, that's when you want these instructions, the good instructions to like, okay, I want you to tell me everything you remember. Please don't guess. If it's out of order, that's fine. These are the standard interviewing methods for what's called a cognitive interview, which is used by the intelligence community and used by police officers who are really well trained. This is a method where you would, before you even start getting into the story, you're framing it. Tell me everything you remember and don't guess. And they would even, in the cognitive interview, what they often do is they even do something they call context reinstatement. And this is where you have the person before they start narrating, what they remember, you ask them to imagine themselves back in the situation, if they're willing to, to close their eyes and to remember everything they can about what they were seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling, thinking, because you're trying to bring that context back to facilitate retrieval. And he did none of that here. So there was this huge shift where 
this best practices would have been to set the table to really make sure she was in the right frame of mind and understood what was needed. Instead, he's, he's going straight into to questions and interrupt. What does the research show about how in interruption, how does it affect the interviewee's impression about their role in the interview? Yeah, so it, it, then they've interviewed people afterwards to ask them what it was like to have that kind of interview versus the other kind. And yeah, and they, they say that, you know, their understanding was that I was to wait for questions to be asked and then answer that very specific question and then wait for another question to be asked. So that's what people will tell you. And also the research just shows that the, when police and other investigators interrupt, they get less information and they get less accurate information. And those studies came out, you know, first of those back in like, I think, 89 or 91, okay. kind of interview. Moving to the next page of the interview, page 41. And I think we're going to use the whole page, but we're just going to chunk it out here. Uh, starting at the top, um, the first lines, 1823 to uh, 1836. Is that an example of an interruption? Yes. How so? Well, you know, so she's saying I was scared. It was the scariest thing I've ever experienced in my life because I've never, I've never felt that in my whole life. Again, if things were set up right, she would know not to stop, but just to keep talking. But things weren't set up right, so she's stopping maybe. Or he's interrupting. I, I can't remember if you know, we'd have to listen to it to see if it was really an interruption or just waiting because that's what she's learned is expected. But you know, this would be a point if you are going to ask a question, you would say, well, okay, scariest thing you've ever felt. Tell me more about that. Tell me everything about that to collect more information. And then the next section after that, 1836, we go down um, to 1848. Is that again a, another interruption? Well, here he just kind of repeats what she says. Um, but, you know, again, if we were listening to it, it might be an interruption or not. Um, but certainly she's not on a free flow and he's repeating it. Um, and so now she's the one saying mm -hmm, to him. And then at the end of the page, then from 1849 uh, to the end of the page, give everybody a chance to read that, I guess. I see on there on 1849 as well as 1854, the question, so then what happened is asked. Right. Do you have any concerns about that question in particular, or that type of question? So asking people for time sequence information is something you have to be very, very careful about. Because as I talked about before, especially if that memory circuitry has gone into the minimal encoding mode, it might not have encoded and stored time sequence information. And so, you know, we train investigators to be very cautious about this. In the same way you don't want to push for peripheral details that might not be there, because you could create inaccuracies, you want to be real careful about asking or pushing for time sequence information that might not be stored in their brain. So that's something we see happening here. And another thing that we see happening here is when someone says, and so then what happened? In, in these cases, she's just given very brief descriptions of something that clearly there was a lot going on there, potentially. And so instead of saying what happened next, the appropriate uh, question for there would be, tell me everything about what they had just said. So, you know, and after that, you know, he left the car and he was laying there and I didn't know what to do. You've got, he left the car, tell me everything about that. Tell me more about that. You know, he was laying there. You said he was laying there. Tell me more about that. Tell me everything about that. There's these missed opportunities to gather a lot more information. Um, if it's in their brain, fine. You can gather that information. If it's not, then that's fine too. But you don't want to just move on to the next thing without milking that for whatever you can get, basically. Um, let alone, you know, asking them what happened next, what happened next. 
um, it can really be a setup for for not getting accurate information. And for the for the person who's being interviewed, again, whether they're a subject or a victim, for them feeling like, you know, a suspect, that you don't really understand. You know, because sometimes people will tell you, like, I don't know what order things happen. And I see this over and over again. Police will still ask them, what happened next? What happened next? And they're feeling, well, what's going on here? Are they not understanding me? Are they not listening? So then sometimes they'll just jump to the end, for example. And in this, in this situation, so this is page 41 where I just did. But before that, I'm putting page 40 back on. And on page 40, in line 1779, the question is, walk me through this. What happened? Is that right? Yeah. And then the next page, page 41, that we just talked about, already at the end, she's finished the story at line 1863. Right. So what, in, a, in an effective interview, you would, you would expect like a half hour, an hour, 90 minutes to unpack that sort of thing. And here we see just in a couple minutes, boom, 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 they're all the way at the end. And that's, you know, a function in part of how that interview was being conducted, how the groundwork was not prepared for her to know what kind of open narrative to give, and then how the questions that were being asked, um, including what happened next, what happened next, when it wasn't even clear what she had just described. And then at, at on 42, at the uh, bottom of the page here on line 1901, That's to the next page that we just talked about. Is that another example of a interruption? Yeah. Yes. It, and, um, on line 1908, where the, the interviewer asks, walk me through again what happened here. Or do you have any concerns about doing that in that position? Well, it's... You know, this happens sometimes when, when people don't have the right training and aren't using the right methods. At the end, they find themselves in this situation. They just have to keep going back over the same thing because they haven't really laid the groundwork for getting it out. And, and sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, so here he's having to start back at the beginning again. Um, but as, you know, as we can see, it's, it's going the same way. It's a little bit of information in the question, a little bit of information in the question. It's not, she's not been trained, basically, to open-ended and, and, and that was what you had talked about before lunch about the the uh, cognitive interviewing techniques of training somebody to do this prior to getting into the guts of that interview. Yeah, and again, this is not to to fault or criticize Detective Proc. You know, as is someone who works as an expert witness on these cases, I review these. I hear these kind of transcripts. I hear audio. I see video. This is not uncommon, um, but. It is, unfortunately, ineffective at getting as much as possible and as accurate as possible information. And that ineffectiveness, does that uh, impede the investigation? Definitely. Could it also impede the <coughs> interviewee's ability to say everything that they may be able to say? Definitely. Yeah, and that's what the research shows. And, you know, it's not good for anybody. It's not good for the prosecution. It's not good for the defense. It's not good for the jury. You don't have as much information to work with. Okay. On page, uh, the next page then is uh, page 43. I think on line 1921, and I know this, I don't want to belabor the point, but 1921 to 1937. I'm off the screen. Thank you. The first question is, what happens then? Is that, I think you've already talked about it, so I don't want to belabor the point. Is that an example of what you were talking about, of the time sequencing? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then farther down that page, um, 1940 to 1955, We can just see if we're looking at, now, when we look at this transcript, there seems to be, like you said, lots of questions, short answers. Is that something that's 
you see throughout this transcript in the second half of the interview on March 24th? Yes. Lots of back and forth, just how you don't want these interviews to be going, and very specific questions rather than open questions. So he pushed me down. Tell me everything about him pushing you down. Tell me more about that. Is the worst, the, if you're going to ask a question there, that's what you would want to ask, not something so specific as where did he push you down? Because now you're biasing what they're trying to retrieve from their, from their memory, and you know, they might not remember where, but they may have other details they remember about being pushed down. So tell me about the, the time sequencing and how asking it in this sequential order might limit it. Do people remember things that way, or are they associated in ways other than through time? Yeah. Sometimes people remember things in temporal order, in, in the order of time, but often they don't, especially in very high stress or traumatic situations, especially once that, if their brain had gone into that minimal encoding mode, that might not be how they remember it. They may remember pieces of it that are connected in some ways according to what they were doing or what they were feeling or who knows. And that's the point. We don't know. The investigator doesn't know. So you want to be very careful about assuming that information is going to be retrieved from their memory in some kind of sequential order. <laughs> and then on the next page, I believe, um, page 44 here, there's a continuation of questions in the beginning from 1960 to 1969. Are those similar sequential questions, questions asked about sequencing? Yeah, questions asked about sequencing and failed opportunities to gather a lot more information about he cut my pants, I tried to grab it, I hurt my hand. Um, he just, you know, moves on to what happens next. Okay, and that gets into, again, I think what you've said about creates this impression of just, um, I'm here for one particular reason to just do what they want. That's a little extreme, but yeah, that's something uh, uh, like, No, and if I yeah, To answer it. questions, yeah, to, okay. to answer questions rather than just to speak freely about everything I can remember. And then this next section here, from 1970 to 1987, um, this is a section uh, where she's asked about the knife and sequencing. Is that right? Well, let's just have some time to absorb it for everybody. <coughs> Right, so she starts off in this exchange by saying how she started to wrestle with him and fight him off and kick and do whatever I could, but I got the knife, and then I just started. So she said several things there, and any of those things could have lasted 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, we don't know. Um, and what the interviewer does is ask a very specific question about how did you get the knife from him? when there's all kinds of other information potentially in there that could potentially be helpful to the investigator um, and to the prosecution, but it wasn't collected. Or it could potentially be helpful to her defense. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Um, Either way. And is, at the, how does it end? What does she say at the end? Yeah, she says, and then I just, I don't know. What does that tell you about time sequencing in this here? that maybe she doesn't know, she, there may be missing pieces of the memory, there may be, she may be not know the time sequence. Uh, you know, just from this, those are like hypotheses we can have that have seemed reasonable, but we would want more information. Okay. And then on uh, next page 45, lines 20, 20 to 20, 36, um, on 718 present there that you see? Yeah, so she's saying anywhere and every, anything and everywhere. And then it's fo that's followed with, you know, he repeats that phrase, 
But then he starts asking specific questions and even leading questions, right? So was he on top of you? Do you know if you stabbed him in the back or any place? So now she's su he's suggesting where she may have stabbed him. So that's a leading question that's suggesting things. And again, that's something you really want to avoid. Okay. Moving uh, ahead to page, I'm sure everyone appreciates if I skip some pages here. Um, page 47, line 2121 to 2139. Is that all on the screen? There we go. Do you ever have concerns about suggesting guessing? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, the, the research, the scientific research shows that the instructions you should give to people you're interviewing, whether they're victims or suspects or whatever, or terrorists, is remember everything you can, please don't guess. Like that's the last thing you want people to be doing is guessing. And so you tell them that right up front. Well, that never happened in this interview. And not only that, now he's explicitly asking her to guess. When you say explicitly asking, I mean, the word guess isn't on there. Do you mean by the word think, or do you? Well, down there at the bottom. So you think you stabbed him in the back? Yeah. Um, Even on line 2121, is he asking, where do you think you stabbed him? Yeah, where do you think? Yeah, right. A couple of ways. Where do you think? Not where do you remember, but where do you think? That's inviting speculation. Okay. And is this, I know we've gone through it, but just to, if you can put it into a time sequence for you here now in this safe space where you can talk about time sequence. Okay. Is this before or after she's ever said anything about, I don't know, regarding time sequence? Um, I, I can't remember. Okay. I just assumed that you were going to show that. <laughs> sure. No. Uh, and that's... I didn't think I'd have to worry about that. But I think it's before. On page 40, so this is page 47. You see that on the bottom? So assuming this goes in chronological order, on page 44 is what we had talked about before, and that's where we had showed the matter about grabbing uh, the knife, um, and she had made this statement on 1987, I don't know. And then I just, I just don't know. Is there a concern in continuing to ask for these time sequence details after a interviewee has already said, I don't know? Yeah, definitely. Why? Again, just a, one of the most basic principles is you don't want them guessing. Okay. And especially if they've already told you they don't know. And I think there's another place in here where she actually comes out and explicitly says, I don't remember the order. And yet, he still continues to ask her time sequence questions. Putting up on page 48, the next page after this, line 2146 uh, to line 2161, Is that one of the places you were referring to where she says, I don't know? Yeah, what you would want the interviewer to say here is, okay, just to be clear, I really don't want you to guess. Not encouraging to guess, it's been encouraging the person not to guess is what effective interviewing techniques calls for here. And then, Skipping ahead to page 40 or 51, excuse me, line 2288 to uh, line 2297. What, if anything, does she say about time sequence in relation to those questions? Well, this is where she comes out and very clearly says, after he says, do you remember when you stabbed him in the throat? No, I don't. I just remember it happening, but I don't remember the time or when. Would you... And then, and then he asks her, do you remember which order the stabbing took place? And she says, no. It was just a bunch. And then it looks like he may have interrupted her, but I'm not sure. Okay. And so that's page 40 or 51. 
after she says, I don't know about time sequence, on page 54, at the bottom on 2456. What does the interviewer do about time sequence? Is he asking more questions about time sequence? Yeah, he's asking for guessing about time sequence, even after she's told him that. And then, uh, and then he tells her to walk him through the order, even though she's already told him that she doesn't know the order. Okay. And so, is... You, is what you've read in Exhibit 290 about Ms. McCandless's statements not knowing the time sequence or saying things like, I don't know. Is that consistent with your training and experience regarding how people who have had these uh, are under stress or uh, have problems with uh, encoding or storage or retrieval would respond? Yeah, I mean, this is commonly seen in victims of many different crimes. It's commonly seen in soldiers who are trying to give an after-action review to their commander uh, after, a, after a battle that uh, is a certain point that in that battle, in that ambush, whatever it was, it, they can't remember the time sequence, so they disagree about the time sequence. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them, it just means that's how the brain can be affected by high stress and traumatic situations. So we've been focusing on this, what I think you, you called context and cues for interviews. Is that right? Context and cues for what? For interviews or for retrieval? Yeah, for facilitating <laughs> the retrieval of memory, yes. How, um, if we shift the focus from the interviewer to the interviewee, what are... Um, some considerations that you want to set up for the interviewee is, is for their, as you say, context or state of mind to most effectively gather information? Well, as I said before, you know, you want, whether it's a crime victim or a suspect or a terrorist, you want to try and have a cooperative interaction with them that's giving them as much choice and freedom within that situation as possible. And you want them to feel as comfortable as possible in the situation. You want to minimize stress because stress impairs retrieval. And you want to make sure that you have helped them understand what you want them to actually do, which is to narrate out loud in as much detail as possible, not waiting for questions, anything you remember, hearing, seeing, smelling, whatever it might be. And those are the effective methods. And then you don't want to interrupt. You don't want to encourage them to guess. You don't want to ask leading questions. Um, those are all the kind of things you want to do. Now, I think you mentioned safe place, a, a feeling of safety. Was that something you just mentioned? Yeah, as much as possible in the situation. I mean, it can be hard to feel safe sitting across from a police officer when you're under investigation, but or being a terrorist uh, suspect. But yeah, you want to make it help them feel as comfortable as possible. Okay. And so, in that sense, safety means more than just a person's physical safety. They're no longer under the, the immediate traumatic event in that safety. You mean something beyond that? Yeah, I mean, if you're under investigation, you know, your, your liberty for the rest of your life is potentially at stake, or for many years or decades if you're sentenced to prison for something or whatever it might be. Okay. And often just to especially um, we see this a lot in sexual assault, you know, it can be very stressful when you're talking about, you know, the most horrible thing that ever happened to you to a stranger. And if you feel like they don't understand you or they might not believe you, that can be very stressful because you're just in such a vulnerable position. How, uh, you, I think you'd mentioned before these burned images and you've mentioned fragments. Mm -hmm. how, how does that play in uh, to this retrieval process? So as I've you know, said that we can make this distinction between central details and peripheral details and the central 
were the ones that for that person, moment by moment, as the experience was unfolding, those are the things that got attention and had significance attached to them. And they're more likely to get in and stick in memory. But the things that didn't get attention, that didn't have significance attached to them at the time, they are either not getting in or they are quickly fading or being lost from memory. And so you end up, if you think of a, a puzzle, with a lot of missing pieces. And so memories of highly stressful and traumatic experiences tend to be pretty fragmented. And there's this paradox where there's a lot of missing pieces, but some of the pieces you do have, you may never forget them for the rest of your life. They may be the thing of nightmares for the rest of your life. And so it's, it can be very paradoxical. There's certain things that are burned in that you can't forget even if you want to, but plenty of other things that you can't remember even if you try. Have you heard the phrase or term intrusive memory before? Yes. Is that what, somewhat what you were talking about there? Yeah, in terms of some things like just keep coming back and tormenting people as flashbacks, what we call intrusive memories or the re-experiencing symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. How can that uh, impede or affect uh, retrieval and or disclosure? So, you know, it can be pretty stressful if you've been through a horrific, violent experience in whatever role you were in. Um, people tend to have images, unwanted images, that come back to them. And it's stressful in and of itself to have those things. And then, you know, understandably, people want to push that stuff away. They want to avoid it because it's distressing, it's overwhelming. They may feel shame and humiliation about these memories and things they remember doing or experiencing. And so, yeah, that, that can make it very hard. So on the one hand, things are coming in when you don't want them to, and on the other hand, you're trying to push them away. I mean, that's what a lot of trauma is. So I think, uh, just to get close to finishing up here, you've talked about different <clears throat> barriers to remembering and reporting. Would that be something we've been talking about, right? Yes. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 719. Uh, is this... Uh, Move for the admission of Exhibit 719, Your Honor. No objection. objection. All right, Exhibit 719 will be received. Permission to publish. You may. Uh, is this list, Dr. Hopper, well, I'm in the way of it here. Can you see it? Yes, I can. Um, tell me about uh, tell me about Exhibit 719. What is that? So, as the title suggests, I mean, this is one way to think about it. These are potential barriers for people to remember and then to report. For example, in the context of an investigative interview, um, things that they've previously experienced. So let's just, uh, is this list comprehensive? No, but it's a good collection of categories that covers a lot. Okay, but there may be more to add to that list. Sure. You, um, so on the list is, uh, are these in any particular order? I mean, they There's are more. On, the, on, the, on this form, they're obviously from top to bottom is how we normally think of it, but do they... Do you think of it as opposed to as a particular order that they may or may not occur? I mean, the only order that's you know inescapable is encoding comes before storage, which comes before retrieval. Um, but otherwise, these factors some um, some of them could be operating at each of those stages, but not all of them. Okay. So disassociation. I think you mentioned that earlier when you talked about somebody perhaps focusing on a part of the ceiling or a mark on the wall. Mm -hmm. I think you said how is how does that a barrier to remembering and or reporting. Judge, I'm going to object, and not that this isn't interesting, um, but I think we've covered all this already, so I believe it's cumulative. Just going through this, and then I... will overrule the objection it. again, but, but you know, just, just be mindful of not being cumulative. Thank you. Go ahead. How does disassociation, or why is that on the list? Okay. So I wasn't here before, so I don't know everything that was said about the association. So I do feel a need to just say a little so I at least know that what I'm talking about when I talk about the association. Um, so dissociation can have a bunch of different meanings. Um, what I'm referring to here is a disassociation, a disconnection of conscious awareness from uh, emotions and body experiences typically. Another way to think about it is a disconnection of some mental processes from others that are usually connected. And so there's a disassociation or a disconnection in people's experience and, and it can disrupt memory and it can disrupt, you know, thought processes. So, again, I, in general, 
disassociation could occur during the event? Yeah, we call that peritraumatic dissociation. And it's typically a reflexive response that automatically kicks in to survive and disconnect from the horrible pain or horror of what's happening in your body. And would that impact encoding, storage, retrieval, all of them? Well, definitely to start with encoding and storage, yes. Like the example I used, if someone's being uh, held up at gunpoint in a mugging, on the one hand, that bottom-up attention may grab onto the gun, but at some point, they may feel like they're floating out of their body and they may dissociate, right, from the fear that's arising in their body. And they may be, you know, looking at the ceiling or looking at, you know, the leaf of a plant or something like that. And so if that's where their attention is, and it's not where kind of the action is of what's being held in their face or what's being done to their body in an assault situation, then, you know, they're not encoding or going to be storing things that they're not paying attention to. How about post-traumatic events? Can a dis dis can disassociation occur then? Definitely, in the retrieval process, yeah, or attempted retrieval, yeah. Okay, tell me just a, briefly, how would that yeah. impact the retrieval process? So... Remember I talked about context, and one of the important contexts is literally the person's bodily state. When people disconnect from their body, and we see this a lot in people who've been involved in violent crimes as victims or even perpetrators, and they're trying to answer questions from an investigator, and they feel totally disconnected from their body, and they're not able to access any of the emotions and body experiences associated with that, it can make it hard for them to retrieve other parts of the experience which are linked to it. And then sometimes they will talk about parts of the experience and it's like they're reading a grocery list or something that's like a really horrific aspect of an assault or something like that. And it can seem unreal to them and it can seem unreal to the investigator because they don't feel it in their gut. So these are the, some of the ways it can impair people's ability to retrieve because they don't have the emotional experience to, to facilitate the retrieval. And it can make things seem less real. They can feel more doubtful about, oh, am I remembering that right? Because it doesn't feel real to me and those sorts of things. And then the next on this list is encoding and storage, and that's essentially what you've talked about already in the peripheral details, central details, how uh, we don't need to go through yeah, that. And the time-dependent effects that, you know, when it's in that super encoding phase, you know, more can get in, get encoded and stored away, but if it goes into the minimal encoding phase, less can get in. Okay. And then on here, the next term after that is avoidance. What do you mean by avoidance? So avoidance in this context has to do with retrieval. As I was saying before, one of the hallmarks of post-traumatic stress disorder is on the one hand, you've got these awful images and maybe body sensations and things popping into your mind, and on the other hand, you really want to push it away. And so sometimes people don't remember things because they're just, they're in a self-protection mode. They just don't want to, it's too painful, it's too scary, it's too disgusting, it's too humiliating, whatever it might be. And then next on there is denial of deceit. What do you mean by that? Well, sometimes people, uh, you know, don't want to admit things, obviously. Um, and sometimes people are actually trying to deceive other people about what they remember. Uh, okay. That happens, and there's a whole variety of reasons that can happen. And then you've talked before, again, the next on the list is stress impairs retrieval. That's, again, about the uh, inability to get the things that have already been encoded or stored. Yeah, we know it affects retrieval processes in the brain. We know some of the neurobiology of that, but it's a very robust finding that in general stress impairs retrieval unless it's stress that like perfectly matches or very well matches what you were experiencing at the time and then it might facilitate retrieval and so those those five that we've just went through are, are like a better term focused on the interviewee would that be fair yeah things inside the interviewee and their mental processes in their brain that can make it harder for them or to remember and or report what they do remember and then the last one on there is the context and cues that we've just gone through many examples of that. And right. that's something that falls more on the interviewer. And that might fall, maybe that's not the right, right. term. Right, but yeah, right. but they, they end up, they have the power in an investigative interview to create the context largely. And then they're the ones asking the questions or instructing the person on how to retrieve memory. So yeah, they're responsible for the cueing for the most part. Are Ezra McCandless's statements on March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of 2018 consistent with the principles you've testified about today? 
given the knowledge I have and the science I've drawn on, um, the things that I saw in those transcripts um, is certainly consistent with someone who's been through a very traumatic experience and who is encountering some of these barriers to retrieval um, in, the, in the interview context, yes. Those are the only questions I have, Judge. All right, and uh, Mr. Hyde, do you want to go ahead with your uh, cross-examination, or I, I don't know if anyone needs a break at this point in time? I'm prepared to proceed, but if someone needs a break, that's fine. Okay. If you're ready to proceed, then, uh, then go ahead, sir. Thank you, Judge. Um, Dr. Hopper, you talked a lot about uh, a lot of different things, and I want to be clear that the principles that you've talked about aren't specific to sexual assault, correct? No, they are often not understood and cause a lot of problems in sexual assault cases, but no, they're the, the human brain under high stress or attack of any kind. So they apply to a variety of different situations, correct? Correct. And really what you're looking at is, uh, and maybe some, some more things, but stress and trauma are the, really the driving force there, correct? Yes. And that's, those are the things that really drive impairment in the things you've discussed, but primarily memory and responses and brain functioning, correct? Yeah, in terms of they affect behavior, thought processes, attention, the encoding and storage, and then potentially retrieval as well. But when we start talking about retrieval of memories, then the other factors can come into play that aren't just about trauma, but are about the, you know, the ability of the interviewer to ask the right questions and create the right context. Sure. Now, the term has been used a couple times, and I think it might be in one of the articles that you wrote, but the brain is under attack. Now, when you mm -hmm. use that phrase, you're not speaking of a literal attack, correct? Well, sometimes I am, sure. But, well, maybe you should tell me what you mean by literal attack. I'm sorry. So um, you're looking more at attack of stress and trauma and how that impacts the brain, correct? So when I talk about the brain under attack, I'm talking about when this defense circuitry appraises the current situation as an attack. Or it's like a, and it could also be a serious threat. I mean, you know, you, you use different language to just try and encapsulate things. But it could be the perception of a threat that does not yet involve, yeah, being physically touched yet, um, for example. But yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an, what we would call an appraisal by the brain that then triggers all kinds of things. And sometimes people misappraise. They think they're under attack and they're not. And I'll, I'm just going to walk through some, and I appreciate the context, I'll walk through some Specific questions, if you don't think you can answer them in the, the shorter narrative, just let me know and we'll, we'll address it, okay? Okay. Thank you. Um, so looking at one of the initial slides, there was, it was the one with the, the diagram that had the super encoding and then the minimal encoding. Mm -hmm. And in the bottom left corner, it said attack detected, correct? Correct. And you said that that could also be labeled when, when fear kicks in or when the stress kicks in, right? Yeah, when stress like seriously kicks in, not just low stress, but like, you know, big head. Okay. Now, we talked about the defense circuitry. There's also fear circuitry, correct? It's the same thing. It used to be called the fear circuitry for a long time. And then people realized, well, this circuitry can be dominating your brain, but you not be, might not be feeling any fear. If you're dissociated, you might not be feeling anything. And also, because we want to be able to line up the animal research, whether it's on rats or monkeys and human beings, and we can't ask rats and monkeys, are you afraid? So defense circuitry seems to be accurate and not have that baggage of, well, what's the subjective experience? Were they dissociated? And we can't ask animals this stuff. But it's sure. the same circuitry, just so this, different new name. So the same impacts and things you've talked about apply to the, it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, there was talk about law enforcement practices. And again, I'm going to ask some more pointed questions. And if you feel you need to elaborate, just let me know and we'll, we'll address that. Okay. Um, but you would agree that law enforcement, and I think you testified to this generally, should show empathy and compassion when interviewing, whether it's a suspect or a victim or a witness, any of those people, right? Yes. And you would agree that an officer's demeanor is important in setting the tone of that interview, correct? It's one important factor, yes. And part of the demeanor is not only the questions that are being asked, but also the tone of voice, the um, 
discussion before questioning starts, all of those things are included, right? Correct. Uh, now, you talked about, we had the transcripts up with Detective Prox's interview. Have you just read the, the transcripts, or have you actually had a chance I've listened to, to it, yeah. You I haven't listened to it in the last 24 to 48 hours, but I, I listened to it before, yeah. Okay. And you would agree that his demeanor is calm and, and respectful of, of the defendant, correct? Oh, yeah. He seems like a really nice guy. And you talked about allowing uh, law enforcement in interviews should allow whatever control is reasonably possible to be given to the person being interviewed, correct? Yeah, and the scientific research, they call that, you know, supporting their autonomy. They're feeling that they are choosing what and when to say and how. And, and that would include the, uh, telling the, the person that's being interviewed that they don't have to talk to law enforcement, right? That's correct. I mean, that's a Miranda warning, right? But just, just generally, that, that would include that information before, if, if before an interview starts. They say, you don't have to talk to me. You can walk out the door if you want. That's part of allowing the, the person being interviewed to have some control, correct? I mean, it could be. I don't know that it would be the wisest strategy to take if you want them to cooperate with you and you want to get yeah, more information. I'm, yeah. I'm not asking yeah, for okay. it could be part of it. I'm just saying that allows them to have some control over what's happening in that room, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just for the court reporter, that's a, you had a mouthful of water. That was a yes, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but you'd also agree, and I think you, this was implied in some of your answers, that there are certain things that law enforcement can't really give up in terms of control, correct? Definitely. And you would also agree that whether the person is uh, a witness or a victim or a suspect that there are certain things depending on the type of case that law enforcement needs to ask in order to get uh, information that they they need right so if it's a if it's a, for example a burglary case they're gonna need to ask some specific things about entry into a house or whatever the facts are right right unfortunately they sometimes do that too soon and end up losing lots of information but yes okay and when you say losing information that might be because they limit they, they skip to a specific part without allowing some of the backstory, correct? Right, and sometimes when they skip to a certain part, it's a gotcha kind of thing, and then that sh stresses and shuts down the other person. They're not feeling very cooperative anymore. Now, and part of a police officer's job um, is to protect victims from crime. You'd agree? Definitely. And as well as apprehend perpetrators of crime, correct? Correct. Now, and I, again, I think you've, you've at least implied this, if not specifically stated it, but there are parts of interviews where it's really unavoidable that a follow-up question or questions need to be asked by law enforcement, correct? Oh, definitely. Now, when we t you talked a lot about leading questions um, and the fact that they might get somebody being interviewed to believe that what's being said is actually true, correct? Who are you referring to? So when, when an officer asks a leading question, just not specific to the not specific to any question on the board um, or the screen, but one of the concerns is that it might suggest something to be true that the person being interviewed might then just accept as being true. Is that correct? That's one possibility of many problems. And if somebody as we saw in at least one of the answers, if somebody, the person being interviewed, pushes back and says, no, it's actually this, that would suggest that they're not, not as susceptible or that their response wasn't overcome by the suggestive nature. I think I hear Siri talking somewhere in the courtroom. Um, just, we'll just hold on for just a second. Okay, and just make sure everybody, everybody's been very good about that, but... Make sure your phones or devices are silenced. Thank you. Okay. Perhaps I said something that sounded like, hey, Siri, or <laughs> something like that. Um, so let me start over with that, with that question. There was at least one example in the snippets that were put up on the screen that you acknowledged that the, the defendant pushed back against a leading question, right? Yes. And that would indicate that the person's answer, in this case the defendant's answer, wasn't overcome by the suggestiveness of the question, correct? In that particular case, yeah. 
And if, assuming that follow-up questions aren't leading questions, and they're just, and then what happened, or in which we, we've discussed the issues with that, but something that's an open-ended, non-leading question, mm -hmm. if the follow-up questions provide information that is independently corroborated from other parts of an investigation, that would also suggest that the response, the answer, wasn't overcome by the leading question. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Now, it's accurate to say that you're, you're concerned in interviews about time sequence, right? Correct. And your primary concern about time sequence is that things that may be described as happening in a certain order might actually be in a different order, correct? That's one concern. Okay. I mentioned others in that if you're asking for something that someone has already told you they don't know, that can have significant consequences on their experience of the interview and whether you really understand them or in that sort of stuff. Now, while you've been able to point out some of the different areas of um, to be addressed in some of the interview snippets that we've seen, mm -hmm. you're not in a position to say exactly what would have or how that would have affected the accuracy of the, the defendant's statements and responses to Detective Proc, correct? Correct. I'm just drawing on what we know from lots of science and research that the kind of things that we saw there on the transcript are associated with less information and less accurate information. Now, I believe there's a copy of a DSM-5 printout in front of you. Is that correct? Uh, some pages from it. On, okay. Yeah. I'm just going to, if I may approach, Judge. You may. That mark. Thank you. It's um, marked as Exhibit 720, correct? Correct. And it looks like it's page 271 to 280. Would you agree? Yes. And that's the, uh, the portion of the DSM-5 that addresses post-traumatic stress disorder, correct? Correct. Yes, and I think there's a, an understanding that this can be moved in as an exhibit. Uh, yes, Judge. All right. Exhibit 720 will be received. Now, can you just explain for the jury a little bit what the DSM-5 is? So it's the fifth version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. <laughs> so this is a book that is put together. Um, the American uh, Psychiatric Association has responsibility for this and publishes the book. And it's an attempt to basically categorize human psychological suffering and to put it into categories of disorders. And so there's you know, mood disorders, there's anxiety disorders, there's dissociative disorders, there's eating disorders, and then within these, and there's others, of course, categories. And what this, people who do this attempt to do is to draw on research and clinical experience to come to an agreement about, well, what is post-traumatic stress disorder or what is acute stress disorder, or, you know, et cetera. And so it's a process that is continually updated and now we're on the fifth version of it. And now is that enough? Yes, thank you. <laughs> is that, you could probably go on for an hour or so, I assume. <laughs> is that a, a document that's widely accepted in your field? For the most part, it's a, it's a necessity to deal with. If you want to bill insurance companies, you got to use it. It, it has a, good, a lot of usefulness for research, uh, but there's definitely aspects of it that are contested for sure. Okay. Um, and specific to the post-traumatic stress disorder, that's what's in front of you, correct? That's the yes. pages 271 to 280, I believe, that we discussed? Yeah. 
Judge, can we just approach for a brief second? Note that there's not an objection uh, on the table here. Um, but just a cautionary discussion. You uh, you may continue. Sir. Thank you, Judge. Sorry about that, Dr. Hopper. We'll <coughs> kind of reloop. So we're talking about uh, we're talking about the DSM specifically post traumatic stress disorder. So shifting from the DSM. So I'm not going to ask you to look directly at it unless you need to, but I don't think you do. Um, you would agree that. Various types of traumatic events can cause PTSD, correct? Correct. <clears throat> and those traumatic uh, events can range in, in severity, correct? Correct. Uh, and an event that might cause PTSD in one person very well might not cause it in somebody else, correct? That's generally true, but some things are bad enough that they're going to cause it in most people, just about everyone, but yeah. Sure. Mr. Hahn, before uh, we continue, and uh, I believe we need to take a restroom break, so we're going to take a 10-minute recess until uh, 2.30. Just make sure everybody's comfortable going through this. Uh, jury may be excused, and we'll be in recess until about 2.30. Dr. Hopper, just to kind of refresh to set the scene where we were, I, I, we were talking about the various different types of incidents that could potentially cause PTSD. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Now, um, there's really no way to put a number on how many different types of events could cause PTSD, is there? I mean, not a number, but if you look at the criteria for PTSD, there have been some boundaries put on what constitutes an event that could be, be said to cause PTSD. Sure, and that was a, a probably a bad question, but I'm just saying, so different, different factual scenarios whether it's, um, I'll just leave it at that. Different factual scenarios, there's no way to say there are 500 different scenarios that could cause PTSD, is there? No, you can't put an exact number on it, no. Okay. And you would agree that there isn't a specific research study for every single type of possible scenario that could cause PTSD, correct? And when you say scenario, like, are you saying, are you, considering, say, sexual assault as a scenario, or are you saying sexual assault could have infinite scenarios within it? Infinite scenarios. So different circumstances are uncountable, probably, that yeah. cause PTSD. Yeah. Unfortunately, the human experience <laughs> gives many possibilities. And there's no, there isn't a specific research study for every possible scenario, correct? Correct. Now, I want to talk about March 22nd, 2018, and that just a couple days prior to the interview that was uh, touched on by defense counsel during direct. Now, your role isn't to be here and tell us what happened that day, right? Definitely not. And you really have no way of actually knowing what happened that day, correct? Correct. Um, and you would agree that people who have committed crimes uh, sometimes intentionally conceal information, correct? Yes. And you would also agree that people who have committed crimes sometimes intentionally lie to avoid, a con avoid consequences, correct? Definitely. And you would agree that people who have committed crimes sometimes misdirect law enforcement in order to avoid consequences, correct? Yes. That's all I have. Thank you. That's it. Any uh, redirect? Um, you were asking. Uh, questions about lying and misdirection. Um, I believe that was on our chart of barriers, correct? Right. Denial and deception, yeah. It's one of the potentials of why somebody may either not remember or not disclose, correct? Correct. Um, and I'm not going to go through the other potentials because um, they're already on that exhibit. I think it was. I'm going to object. This is outside the scope of cross-examination. He was asking about lying and deceit, and I was trying to just put it into the context of what his previous testimony was, which was... Okay, well, if you're going into lying and deceit, I think that's uh, within the scope of cross. So. I'm not pulling this out. I'm, I'm just saying that was on the, 
list of, uh, along with other factors on Exhibit 719 that we'd previously labeled potential barriers to remembering and reporting, right? Correct. So that's consistent with lots of things, perhaps, right? I mean, correct. You would, um, you were asked some questions on um, cross and gave an answer about the context in which, or the, the situation in which there's less information and less accurate information based upon, I think, what you talked about on direct. Do you remember that? Can you be a little more sure. clear? So I, th I think essentially your testimony in general, and it was also covered on cross, okay. was that there's these, my word, maybe Mr. Hahn used the same word, situations, scenarios, circumstances in which there might be less information provided and or less accurate information provided based upon all the circumstances that you've talked about, right? Correct. I believe this was also covered on there is you've talked about how retrieval might improve over time. Right? I'm going to object. I think that's outside this. It is, of. but it's the. I want to talk about this in relation. It's connected, and I just have two follow. I'm not going to go back into it. I want to. It's a premise of the next you question. Give a little bit of again. Just keep in mind the uh, scope of uh, redirect. Right. And so, the one premise is the less information, the less accurate. Uh, the second, uh, is there's improved retrieval over time. In certain situations, correct? Yeah, as a function of context and cues and stress level and things, it can improve over time. Yes. So if if those two things happen, and then somebody eventually, under whatever circumstances, provides new information or different information, depending upon somebody's interpretation of it, I'm going to object to scope. This goes to directly to their part, their argument about lies and their theory that inconsistencies are essentially lies. I have three follow-up questions here to just button that up to make sure that it's clear on his testimony. All right. I'm going to, I'll overall get you, but again, keep in mind you're, you're getting close to the edge. To I be, appreciate it. Beyond the scope. So that does, does that mean that if somebody later, provide new or different information that may be inconsistent with information that was previously retrieved or uh, disclosed. Is that new information wrong? I'm object that calls for speculation. And that's maybe not the state. Right. Maybe that's not the right. Is the contact is providing new information consistent with a disclosure by a trauma victim. So new information can arise as a function of new contexts and cues, and we need to make a distinction, a couple of distinctions. One, is it about peripheral or central details? Because we should not be surprised if there's inconsistencies around peripheral details, because that is encoded and stored less well and sometimes lost, and then people are trying to remember and may get it wrong and not remember accurately in the future. And then also this can happen with the time sequence issue, that there can be inconsistencies around that, which you know, are, are quite normal because the information might not be there and the person's trying to answer the question and gets it mixed up at different times. So if we make distinctions, that can help shed light on that issue of what is it that's inconsistent? Is it just a peripheral detail or is it something that you know was really central? And that can be hard to discern. That was my next question is how would you discern whether something is a peripheral detail or a central detail if you're not the person who's disclosing that? Is there a way for those of us not in that person's head to be able to distinguish between a peripheral detail or a, or a central detail? I mean, they tend to be the things that people mention first. They tend to be the things that have more emotion attached to them. Um, they tend to be. There are some things that they tend to be, but you know, these are complex situations and there can be other variables in play. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Any recross? <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you.